Yo, what's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Off the Glass podcast. As always, I'm Billy. I got my man Dame here with me. Um, and we got a lot to talk about, as always. Second round is completely underway now. Um, every series, I think, has one game um, or one or two games so far, um, with the last one tipping off last night with Lakers and Warriors. Um, some generational second round matchups going on right now. And, and uh, really, when you think about it, probably more, more likely than not, the last time we'll probably see LeBron and Steph play off uh, against each other in the postseason. So That's crazy. I'm locking into each of these games. <laughs> I was locked in on the one last night. And, um, you know, before we get too deep into it, I was got to get the housekeeping out of the way. You know, please like, comment, subscribe to the channel. Um, as you can see, we're on a new channel dedicated just to the podcast. So um, continue to subscribe and, and like these videos, share with everybody. Um, our, our my channel is going to be in the description as well as well as both of our socials. So you know, follow us on, on Twitter, Instagram, um, and yeah, you know, without further ado, we're just going to get right into it because you know the games last night, um, especially that Lakers Warriors game was it's living up to the hype already. Um, so you know, as the the Lakers fan here, I'm always going to give you the floor first. So you know, would you see last night the Lakers were able to to pull it out there? Lakers in four, man. In Lakers four? No, no, nah, nah, let, nah, let me stop playing. Let me stop playing. Now, honestly, though, this it, is going to be a great series. It's going to be a real, real good series. But some things I liked, I liked the way our guards played. I really liked the way our guards played, like, offensively. Um, the scoring was pretty spread out. Like, I know Anthony Davis had 30 points, but I think LeBron had around 20-something. D'Lo had, like, 18, 19, something like that. Schroeder off the bench gave some great scoring. So I liked the way our guards played offensively. Defensively, going into the series, I was a little bit worried. I'm not going to lie. I I, I had a feeling Vando was going to guard Steph, but I'm like, like who's going to guard Wiggins? Like, I, I saw we had D'Angelo Russell on Wiggins, which is, like, it's tough because Wiggins is, a, what, like 6'8", six, 6'9". Six, yeah. D'Lo's not that tall. So I was a little bit worried about stuff like that. But defensively, I feel like we, we played well. Um, There was a couple of times we had a couple lapses on some threes. You know, it's tough guarding the Warriors. They do a million screens every single possession, yeah. so it's a little bit tough guarding that, but – I feel like we played well. Um, we played the way we needed to play as far as slowing the game down a little bit, attacking the rim, points in the paint, getting to the free throw line. Then the free throw discrepancy was like 25 to 6, something like that, which yeah. is, I mean, we're going against a jump shooting team. Like, you're not going right. to get to the free throw line. Like, I saw a couple Warriors fans complaining about that, but it's like, you shoot, th you shot 53s, bro. You can't get right. 53s and 20 free throws. Like, you're not going to get whistles if you're not driving, right? Like, exactly. The so, reality. Yeah, so like I said, we played the way we needed to play. Anthony Davis had a great game. Um, like I said, Vandal played well on Steph. So I'm mean, I'm excited. I'm happy we stole game one. You know what I'm saying? So, but it, it's gonna be it's definitely gonna be a real good series. Definitely gonna be a real good series. I see it going like six minimum. I don't think any team on either side is gonna end this game end this series quick. I should say. Yeah, uh, I agree. I think definitely six or seven game series, regardless of, of who comes out. Um, just because of how much talent and how much of a chess match it, it's going to be. And you can already see it from the first game, like two completely different styles of basketball going up against each other. Um, and with, like, like you said, with the Lakers, right? Like they shot 25 threes, went six for 25. <laughs> the Warriors doubled that, shot 53 threes, made 21, shot 40% from three and lost. <laughs> yeah, that's um, crazy. That is yeah, I think, I think it's the first time ever I, think <clears throat> I saw on the broadcast they had three different people make six threes in a playoff game, um, and it was in a loss. So, like I said, I think the biggest key out of everything, like, there's a lot to talk about, you know, in this series as a whole, but even in this particular game. Um, Anthony Davis, I think, was far and away the best player on the court last night, right? Mm -hmm. Like, that has been, like, the – what the Lakers have envisioned – if happening and it's really especially it's starting to feel like that torch is really being passed like this is your show now like LeBron yeah. is here as the, the number two guy um but when AD is playing like he played last night like hyper efficient with 11 for 19 from the field super aggressive on the offensive side of the ball they were running a lot of like pin down screens for him which I really like kind of letting him get the ball um, with a head of steam driving, just like getting it to him at a, at a good spot, you know, in the you know short mid range area. Um, so he finished with 30 points, 23 rebounds. Him and Looney are going to be <laughs> going at it for these boards, man. <laughs> That's um, going to be crazy. 
Combined yeah. for 46 rebounds between two players is insane. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, they – he – and playing 44 minutes is huge. Right? They did not come out the mm-hmm. entire second half, um, which I think is key because, right, like if they lose – even if they lose the next game, which I think is most likely probable, right? We're going to get blown out next I game. Can't, <laughs> I can't see the Warriors out. dropping two at home. Right. Um, you know, just – understanding the magnitude of the situation right you don't want to go to la down oh two um so i expect them to to come out you know ready to go for game two but um understanding the the situation him and darvin Ham being on the same page like let him run the whole second half we need his presence on the floor uh and it made a huge difference he deterred so many shots at the rim i think he had four blocks as well um you know it was everywhere on the the glass on the offensive and defensive side and like i said it was just a presence um, you know, on both sides of the ball for the Lakers. I said the best player on the court last night. Um, crazy to see LeBron spotting up as much as he did. Um, I think he's made like six of his last like 53, some crazy. It's, statistic. it's bad. It is. He's shooting terrible and it pisses me off because I don't know if his foot is still bothering him. He's still not 100%, but it's like you see him shooting so many threes, like. The fact that he's like, what, last night I think he was one for eight from three. Mm-hmm. It's like, you don't have it going from three. Like, you don't need to shoot eight of them. Like, obviously, when you drive to the basket, they can't really contest you. They can't really stop you. Pretty much every time he drove, it was he he got an easy basket or a dump off to Anthony Davis or something like that. But the fact that he shoots so many threes sometimes, it's a little frustrating. But, I mean, we still got to win anyways. Yeah, he's six for 42 from three this postseason. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, like, you gotta stop shooting LeBron. You got to like it's getting to the point where they're leaving him, like they're leaving him open, right? Like, and so in- <laughs> that gets me into like one of two of the big things that I saw last night that I think are going to really affect how this series goes is a on the defensive side of the ball, right? Like they're trying to keep LeBron on Draymond as much as possible. When you watch that, that really just allows him to do what he's done best, especially this postseason run, which is minimize the amount of effort he has to provide on the defensive end. He's not going to have to chase through a lot of screens, which we saw the Lakers clearly was a concerted effort to, like, leave AD down low, leave LeBron down low, and, like, y'all are just going to have to chase around these screens. And they're content with giving up some threes off of it if that takes away some of these free rolls that they would have otherwise trying to blitz off of some of these you know, pick and roll opportunities or off ball screens that they run or DHO actions. Right. But that also lets LeBron do, which he had a couple of last night, is sit there for some, you know, chase down blocks and pin downs or pins off the glass. um, Which I think is, you know, that's going to be huge. I don't know what the answer is then for the Warriors either. You know, Draymond's Mm going to have to shoot some more of those shots or have to find a way to, you know, fill those minutes with somebody else, you know, and try to, basically you're, you're going to have to find ways to get LeBron involved on the defensive end. If I'm Steve Kerr, like we can't just let him sit there as much as he was. If you watch a lot of their, you know, possessions from last night, he's just standing because he doesn't have to go anywhere. Mm-hmm. Right. So that's huge there. And then again, on the other side of the ball, you have them doing the same thing to LeBron and Vando. Like we're just content with letting them shoot shots and, you know, trying to play off of everybody else from the perimeter. So it's clear that both teams obviously have a game plan as to, you know, we're okay with certain people having perimeter perimeter shots. Um, and it's going to be, I think, a huge chess match going forward as to how, you know, if both teams adjust that. As well as you saw the Warriors go with some zone action last night, especially in the, they ran it a couple of different times in the fourth, which to mm-hmm. me, if I was a Warriors fan, I would be kind of concerned about um, just with – you know, obviously, if they get the shooters going on the, the Lakers side of the ball, right, like if you have a lineup with like Rui, D'Lo, and Austin Reeves in with AD and LeBron, and it's like, you know, there's a lot of options there where you can keep AD down low. And you even saw in one of the possessions, like LeBron sees zone, instantly sprints to the free throw line, and it's, you know, driving and kicking from there, which is exactly what you would want. Um, on a lot of LeBron's post-ups, he had a ton of space behind him to work in like the low block, so – I just, you know, watching it as a, if I was a Warriors fan, I would be kind of concerned trying to throw zone looks at LeBron James teams period. Right. Which is how, you know, how, how much of a high IQ player he's going to be. 
Um, I don't think that's going to deter him from making good reads at all. It's probably just going to open up the floor even more. Um, so that, that I think is going to be interesting going forward to see what, what Kerr does with that moving forward. But yeah, like, like you said, um, shooting struggles for LeBron have been rough, but um, AD having the monster night that he did, D'Lo had a couple of really nice shots there down the, uh, you know, in the third quarter. Um, game is looking really smooth last night too. Had a couple of nice snatchbacks. So, um, you got Lakers it, team, sure. yes, Lakers team is. They are looking. Winning scary. the championship, man. <laughs> we winning the championship, man. I'm telling you, people. Listen, people doubted us. I was trying to tell people we're a championship contender, bro. I'm telling you. But um, going back to your point about the zone, um, I feel like, like you said, it is tough uh, playing zone against any like LeBron James led team right. just because his basketball IQ is so high, but. I feel like they were at a point where Anthony Davis was just so dominant and we were getting so many points in the paint that it's just they had to switch something up. They had to try something. And then once we have a lineup, normally our starting lineup, we have Vando out there, we have LeBron out there. It's like a lot of teams, not even just the Warriors, a lot of teams when they play us, they leave Vando open like a lot of times for that corner three and just say, we're just going to pack the paint. We're not going to let Anthony Davis beat us. And he's just going to have to hit that shot consistently. But it's going to get a little bit tough when – um. It's gonna it's gonna get a little bit tough um, if our shooters are hitting shots, um, right. so it's definitely gonna be a little bit tougher to run that zone against us. But I, I, it, it gave us a little bit of problems. I'm not gonna lie. Like we had to, actually, it was a point we had to sub Vando out just because we needed more offensive mm-hmm. scoring because that zone was giving us a little bit of problems. So like I said, it's gonna be real real interesting to see like the chess match between Steve Kerr, Darvin Ham, the Lakers, and the Warriors. So it's gonna be real real interesting. But yeah, like you said, back it's back and forth too because a lot of times when I was watching the game, even from the jump. It just seemed like we were content with letting every other person on the court shoot besides Stephen Clay. And obviously, when Jordan Poole got in the game, he got hot. We played him, uh, played him tight as well. But Gary Payne Jr. when he was in the game, right, we're sitting in the paint. Draymond, we're sitting in the paint. Looney, like there's the times Looney is at like almost at the not the block, but he's at the free throw line basically. Right. Like if he had like a little floater or something, like it's is there. But Looney is not even thinking about scoring the basketball, which is the way they play. So. Um, like I said, it's gonna be a, a good chess match. So I'm interested to see how that how that goes moving forward. Yeah, also, and I've seen people talk about it on Twitter a little bit. I'm surprised that at least in this game, and I'm sure I'd imagine we see it going forward, but no Kaminga or Anthony Lamb for the Warriors at all. Both got DMPs last night, and like you said, like sagging so far off of Looney, like as much of an impact as he has on the glass, like that does become a hindrance to the whole offense. If somebody is that, that much lacking of a threat to score that you can just, you know, completely eliminate having to really guard them at all. Um, but putting a guy like Kaminga, you know, even for spot minutes who at least can attack closeouts, you know, is a better shooter will shoot. You know, I don't think Kaminga's made a three all year, um, you know, and, and still provides a lot of athleticism and, you know, help defense ability. Um, so I'm sure we'll have, he'll have to see looks in the series just to see what, what he can bring. Um, that's a move that I would imagine that Kerr has to make at some point. Um, they didn't even play Looney down the stretch, it seemed like, uh, in that fourth quarter. I think Looney was on the bench for a lot. Yeah, and, and a lot of that is, again, just, like, spacing. Like, the only reason they were able really to make that run there that to, to cut into it was a 12-point gap with, you know, like seven or six minutes left there in the fourth mm-hmm. um, is because they, you know, basically put Draymond at the five and then just – brought in, you know, Steph, Poole, Clay, and Wiggins to just shoot. Um, and it's hard with that much spacing. You saw, um, again, down the stretch, like, Steph just started pushing the pace, and Draymond's catching rebounds, pushing the pace, and just trying to get good looks to their shooters as much as they can because at the end of the day, no lead is really ever safe with this team. And, that, again, is evident last night where, you mm-hmm. know, they're one shot away from tying it within 10 seconds. So, it's a scary team. Like we know what the Warriors, like no lead is ever safe. Like I just said, they are always only a few shots out of, of being in any game. I want to ask you this. It just popped in my head. And I saw a lot of people talking about this after the Grizzly series. I don't think we talked about it at all. What do you like just your general opinion on Darvin Ham as a coach? I think he's a first year head coach. I feel like, I think he has the makings to be a good coach. I feel like he just has some times where it's, it's like growing pain. You know what I'm saying? I feel like I like this is his first time being a head coach, so there's times that that's going to show a little bit. But I feel like 
Um, he's improved throughout the season. I definitely feel like that. I feel like there's times where earlier in the season, a team would go on a long run and Darvin Ham's not calling a timeout. And in the game, I believe it was game, this, the game that we closed out the, the Grizzlies, game six, mm-hmm. um, we had like a 20-point lead, something like that. I think Desmond Bain hits one three, instantly timeout. Like, to me, that's improvement. You know what I mean? Like, that's mm-hmm. we're not even going to give them the chance to have any momentum going any sort of a run. So I just feel like it's going to imp- improve. We just hope that it's, you know, those pains don't really show in this series and the series moving forward. So I think he's I think he's a solid coach. I feel like a lot of people, they give him a, a little bit too much – um a little bit too much heat, but I feel like that's just – that's how the Lakers are. That's how LeBron teams are. Like, sometimes yeah. when things aren't going well, like, somebody has to be the scapegoat. So, I, I definitely – I'm not – definitely not giving up on Dharma him. I don't think he's a bad coach or anything. So, I, I think he's a solid coach. Okay, yeah, because I saw – I've seen people talk about it on Twitter back and forth for most of the season. And then I think it was the Ringer podcast with Chris Vernon and Kevin O'Connor were talking about – the the Grizzlies Lakers series, <laughs> Kevin O'Connor was like, Darvin Ham sucks. He's a horrible coach. And <laughs> Chris Vernon, who's a Grizzlies fan, was like, I don't think it has anything to do with Darvin Ham as much as it's just like, if you're a LeBron James, like if, if you're the head coach of a LeBron James team, if everything is going great, it's LeBron. If everything right. is going horrible, <laughs> this coach is terrible. Right. And that's how exactly. it's been <laughs> his whole career. So it's like mm. that is you know, what comes with playing with such a great player um, or comes with coaching such a great player. Um, cause I haven't seen anything from Darvin Ham that's made me be like, he's a bad coach. Like, like you said, he's a first year head coach. He's going to continue to kind of feel out this process. His first time ever coaching in the playoffs. Right. Like it's, you got to give him some time, some room right. to grow. And I was like, the first time coach coaching LeBron James. Like, it's not like he's has a bad team where you have room to make mistakes. It's like everything is magnified, especially when you're in LA and you have LeBron James. It's like all the all his mistakes are going to seem like they're way bigger than what they really are. When it's like he's the first time coach, it's really not that serious. Especially like earlier in the year when people were giving him a lot of heat. I'm like, our roster was so bad. It's like right. I don't. It doesn't matter who what coach we had. Like we could have Phil Jackson out there. Like it doesn't matter. Like that roster was just not good. So, yeah, uh, yeah he, I feel like he gets a little bit too much heat. Yeah, I agree. Um, another thing that I was thinking about watching the game last night and only gets, I think, more prevalent the more consistent that AD is having these nights like this in the postseason is do y'all really need LeBron to be playing 40 minutes? At this, I, sometimes I feel like his presence is just like his presence on the court. Even if he's not really producing offensively, I just feel like that's a big that like that's a big thing. Especially because even um when he's not really scoring too well or he's not really doing well offensively, I know he doesn't like sit in the chair defensively, but just his IQ on the defensive and like you see, like you said, he had a couple of like great blocks, a couple mm-hmm. of nice chase downs. So, I mean, forty minutes it's a little tough because. Honestly, I'm I'm starting to think he's not really a hundred percent healthy from that foot injury, so mm-hmm. it's a little bit tough. He definitely shouldn't be playing more minutes than Anthony Davis. Anthony Davis should be on the court majority of the time. He's obviously our best player right now, but um, if we can find time in the game to get uh to get LeBron James rest, I would hope we can do that. But I feel like there's a lot of times where his presence on the court is just needed. Yeah, I can see that, but it's like times where I'm watching them that like. Right, like you were in a possession, like here go LeBron, shoot a three. Or like mm-hmm. time running down, LeBron has a ball. He could do something, could make a move, and it's like dribble, dribble, shoot a three. It's like, yeah. If that's what you're bringing right now, and again, if it's like you know, you're gassed, completely fair, bro. You're 38, <laughs> right? Like you right. should not be having to play this much minutes um, and come and dealing with the foot injury, right? At what point is it? okay to say like hey you can come out come get a blow for you know three four minutes whatever we can bring in Rui bring in Dennis Schroeder whoever and like just run the offense a different way because again a lot of times especially you see last night like in in this postseason as a whole like he's really gotten comfortable playing off the ball more than ever in his career letting D'Lo work pick and rolls letting AR handle the ball handle the ball letting Schroeder come in and handle the ball running through AD like it's it's weird to watch him like kind of stand off and play off ball, but that's allowing him to play this level of minutes. So like at the same time, why not just, you know, give him quick blows here or there and sub in somebody else who, again, like Rui who can come in and has been having a great postseason so far. Um, 
and then you just, you know, let him come in and is always able to provide a little bit more energy on both sides of the ball because instead of playing 40, maybe he's playing, you know, 32, 33 minutes that game, or he's just coming off of, you know, three, four minute rest or something like that. Mm-hmm. No, yeah, I, I, I definitely see what you're saying. Um, and especially nights like last night where we have D'Lo that that has it going, Schroeder has it going offensively. And nights like that, I definitely could agree with what you're saying. Like, if we have guys that are producing on the offensive end, especially ball handlers like D'Lo, Austin Reeves or whatever, that is running the offense, scoring, getting AD the ball, then I can see I can see that, like LeBron getting – maybe taking a little bit longer rest than he normally would take. So, it makes yeah. sense. And we can't can't – Talk about game one of the series without touching on Jordan Poole's shot there. <laughs> Ten seconds left. Good shot. Great shot. <laughs> Love it. Shoot more you, of those, Jordan. <laughs> did you see? I didn't even know. Snoop Dogg was on first take, I think, earlier in the week. And he was like, yeah, mm. bro. He's like, Jordan Poole, I like the way you bench you. Keep shooting, though. <laughs> um, Listen, man, that's, that was a crazy shot. That was that, Honestly, as soon as he shot it, I, sw- I swear to God, as in, as soon as he shot the ball, I said, oh, my God, he's an idiot. Like, before it even missed, I said, oh, my God, because they have 10 seconds left. It's not like yeah. – I would understand if it was three seconds. Like, if it was, like, three seconds, even maybe even five seconds, like, that's probably the best look best look you're going to get. But with 10 seconds and we're scrambling, it's not like we have a set defense. Like, we're yeah. trying to find shooters right now. We're scrambling a little bit. So, he definitely he definitely could have either stepped in or got a better look. Yeah, I, I've thought about it. I was kind of on the – Obviously on the same side, we're like, with 10 seconds left, that's a wild – he's standing behind Darvin Ham. Like, <laughs> he's like 38 <laughs> feet away from the basket. Granted, it was an open shot. He had it going a little bit. I will say that. He was like – he had it going. This is what I'm going to say. And I I put him in my parlay last night because they had him set at one and a half threes, which is crazy because he's been shooting so horribly. Mm. But – how many of his threes last night was he genuinely like trying to foul bait? Like all of them looked like yeah. he's yeah. just shooting them crazy. It felt like way too much luck. Like obviously, like he's trying to make it, he's an NBA player, but like, bro, even the one on D Lo where he got the four point play, it's like you banking it in. It's like I that one was you, complete luck. You don't got it going as much as it felt like you did, you know, right? Um, mm-hmm. So I think that definitely played a factor into him just being like. I made like five already. I got it. I'm open. I'm gonna shoot it. So I understand. Um, he definitely did not have to shoot. That <laughs> shot. Such a bad shot, bro. That's such a bad shot. At that point, right, it's a three point game. Like y'all can hold for the last shot in ten seconds. I don't remember. They don't. They don't have. A, didn't have a timeout. I don't think. Right. I'm not. I'm not sure. Honestly, um, I'm not sure. I don't think they did. So like, even even that that right like. There's no harm in just like catching it. Like 10 seconds, y'all have enough time to find a different look. It's not like, like you said, if it was two seconds, three seconds, whatever, it's like that's that's an open look you take it. You don't, you're not gonna have time to find something else. 10 seconds is a different story. Um, I think Tyrese Halliburton was on, I don't remember, he's on something with like Taylor Rooks and, and Shane Fry. He was like, I don't know why I was so upset. It's an open shot, which is, like I said, it's true, it's open, but. It's a wild shot. It's a wild, it's a wild shot. You if the time was different, I could understand it from from Jordan Poole. But with 10 seconds with Steph, who again probably wouldn't have got the shot up anywhere. Like it looked like they doubled him as soon as he had it. So like mm-hmm. it was gonna have to be anybody but him. But like you said, dribble in something, like you do not have to pull it from that that deep, especially as as many shots as he's made off the dribble, try and draw fouls or not that night. Like it can't hurt. It cannot hurt. <laughs> yeah, it's um, <clears throat> excuse me. It's, it, it, I don't agree with the shot. It was a bad shot. I'm just trying to play devil's advocate a little bit. I can see why. I'm just thinking of of, of a basketball player. Like beginning of the game, he made what three straight threes. Like yeah. he he had it going a little bit, regardless of if it was luck or not. When you see the ball go into the basket, whether you bank it in something, it gives you a little bit more confidence, regardless mm-hmm. of whether you tried to make it. It was complete luck, whatever. And then he also had another one where he did just throw it at the basket, but it was it was all net. Like he he cashed it. I was pissed, but he cashed it. It was all net. Yeah. So it's like luck or not. I mean, you might just feel like it's it maybe your night. You know what I'm saying? Right. You might just have it going. So I can see the thought process of like trying to be the hero. Like I already made some crazy shots. Like if I tie this game, like 
I'm I'm the hero. I'm the guy. Yeah. You know? So I'm, I can see why, but yeah, it, it was. I I feel like you could have got a better look than that. But if keep he, shooting that though. Keep shooting. That. <laughs> <laughs> if he makes it, you know the the media narrative is gonna. I be broke my TV. Completely different. <laughs> I I promise you. After after the two that he made, when he was just throwing the ball at the basket, if he made that. I was breaking my TV. I promise. The, the one he made with D'Angelo Russell, where he drew the foul and banked it in. I'm I'm looking at my TV like, bro, come on, like, yeah. and he celebrate. I'm like, you did. I'm about to say, you know, that's complete <laughs> luck, and you're over here you taunting. Like, you come on, genuinely bro. did not try to make that. Foul. You just <laughs> were trying to draw the foul. Like, right. Um. But yeah, if he'd have made the shot, it would have been a completely different. Tune everybody would have been singing today, because mm-hmm. like he would have had. I've been in seven three of the game. Like it'd have been a completely different outlook. It would have just been like Warriors offense. You know he's taking it. Shooters got to shoot. It'd been a whole different different thing. Um, I will say too. He also did. I forgot. He did make that big three to tie the game originally before D'Lo had that layup. So it yeah. wasn't like the his shots and second half were complete luck. He did just come off of making the three. Yeah, so I, I said I think it's probably getting more hate than it needs to. Like again, at the end of the day, in 2023 NBA, like that's an open look on a team that sh- shoots a ridiculous amount of threes from that range, anyway. So it's not the absolute worst shot. He definitely could have found a better one, but uh, he missed it, and uh, that was all she wrote for that game. Lakers going and steal Game One in Golden State. Um, they're playing every other day um, this entire series, which is great <laughs> for, for the viewer, for the fans. Right. Um, so even when they're, you know, after game two and they travel to L.A., it's only a one-day rest. So that's big for, again, LeBron and A.D. Um, with how much, you know, physicality they're giving in LeBron, you know, coming <laughs> off of the foot injury. Um, and the Warriors team as a whole only had one day of rest coming off the seven-game series in Sacramento. So they're always going to be kind of trying to keep their legs under them. So – Fatigue is definitely going to play a factor in this this series, especially like I said, with the the lack of rest days. So, yeah, look, game one delivered for sure. Game one definitely delivered. And look, if, if this is the last time that we see LeBron and Steph go at it in the playoffs, game one is certainly a good way to to, to kick off that show. One hundred percent. I just listen, can't agree more. I can't wait. I like I said, I do feel like we're going to lose game two. I don't see a way that Golden State. Like goes down 0-2 at home, but um, I, I expect to lose game two, and I think we're gonna we're gonna win at home court. So I think we're gonna win the two straight after we lose a game two. So can't wait. It's gonna be a great series. It's gonna be a real great series. Yeah, for sure. Looking at um another game that happened yesterday, um, at the Knicks evening up the series against the Heat, um, at their at home, um, in the Garden. Um, we're able to, to even that up. No Jimmy in this game, um, you know, still dealing with the ankle injury. He was getting into with some of the Knicks fans there towards the end. So it seems like he's probably going to be geared up and ready to go when they get to Miami, um, hopefully for game three. Because honestly, watching that game, like at the end of the day, right, a win is a win. But the fact that the game is that close with no Jimmy and no Tyler Hero does not – seem great for the Knicks. I saw Knicks fans try to compare losing game one without Julius Randle to the fact that they were able to, to the, the, the Heat lost game two without Jimmy Butler. But again, when you look at the context of their team construction as a whole, right, like without Tyler Hero or Jimmy Butler, like the fact that they're able to keep up at all, and a lot of that is predicated to just their defense really like it's so scrappy to score, especially like in the second and third quarter in that game. Um, super low scoring. Every bucket felt like it was tough to come by. Um, but keeping it that close without Jimmy, to me, is not a good sign for the Knicks. And if he's able to get back healthy, um, they're going to have their hands full, especially going to Miami now that they've lost home court. Um, I don't know. I'm a little a little afraid for the Knicks. I felt like I, they would perform a little bit better, um, especially in this game particularly. Like, this felt like they needed to really just come out and kind of put their foot on the gas, um, have like a wire-to-wire win. Um, and it was tight all the way down the stretch. Yeah, it's definitely a little concerning. Um, 
considering the fact that you lost game one at home, mm -hmm. you know this is a must win. You know they don't have Jimmy Butler. Obviously, they don't have Tyler Hero. You got what is it? I have I have it pulled over here. You got twenty four points from R.J. Barrett, twenty five from Randall, thirty from Brunson, and you guys. I'm not gonna say squeaked out with the win, but it was it was very close. I, I would say close. squeaked out. It was yeah. <clears throat> no, it never really felt like it was super safe, and some of that has to be like giving credit to guys like you know like Gabe Vincent having a huge night last night. I honestly it's really turned it up in the playoffs um, for them. It's like they're just. I think it's just Spolster really is like as good of a coach he is. I feel like maybe he's still underrated because. The fact that he's able to coach this well, again, missing his two biggest offensive weapons and be that close to winning a second round game against a scrappy Knicks team, who's also, again, like well coached defensively, well coached as a whole um, with all their guys on the court. Obviously, Julius Randle is probably a little hobbled. I know, you know, Jalen Brunson's dealing with some injuries, but at the end of the day, they're on the court playing. Um and you're able to keep it tight with no Jimmy and Tyler is a testament to their culture, a testament to, to their coaching um, and just guys stepping up and, you know, and trying to fill gaps. So, yeah, I uh, have a lot of notes on this, this game, especially with last night. Um, I said, I think um, similarly to the, the Lakers warrior series, the heat came out with a, a lot of zone for most of this game. Um, we're in a lot of like kind of like a two, three type hybrid look, um, mm -hmm. trying to keep Bam down low as much as they could. That help, you know, obviously always is anytime running any type of defensive scheme has its pros and cons, but particularly in this game, that let Harnstein get a ton of offensive rebounds. Just again, it's just gonna, always going to be tougher to box out and get on the glass when you're running a zone. Um, so that Harnstein had a huge, huge game for them yesterday. Um, ton of hustle plays, ton of offensive rebounds, giving them extra possessions as well. Um, and R.J. Barrett had it going in the first half, and then Jalen Brunson really kind of, you know, carried the way home there in the second half. So, um, yeah, at the end of the day, a win is a win. I know Knicks fans are, are happy to take it and, and needed one um, to even up the series there. But nonetheless, I, I'm definitely concerned for them just with their performance um, against a, a Jimmy butler list, Tyler hero list Heat team. Yeah, as someone who picked the Knicks to win the series, I'm definitely a little bit worried. If I was a Knicks mm -hmm. fan, I would be, I would definitely be a little bit concerned moving forward. But honestly, I wanted to ask you a question because a lot of people talk about, you know, playoff Jimmy, you know, how he improves himself when the playoffs come around. But it's been really crazy to see. I feel like the Heat as a whole, just like as a, as a team, has improved tremendously. Yeah. Like when the playoffs come around, as far as like. They're shooting, their defense. Like, I mean, they've always been a great defensive team, but like we talked about before, they've, they've never been a great shooting team. Now it feels like between the Bucs series and this series, it's just like offensively they, they've they improved a lot since the regular season. So I just want – do you feel like that a lot of that is on Spolstra or like what is their biggest reasoning to this like – I guess this switch that they flip? Yeah, I think it's got to go to Spo, right? Like you have guys around the league that are seen as like – playoff risers, right? Like Jamal Murray, Jimmy Butler, Donovan Mitchell, like as good as they are, you know, night in, night out, like they have that extra gear they tap into once it's the postseason. And I feel like a lot of that for this team, again, especially this season, but as we've just seen in the past with Spolstra is he just is always able to find guys. Again, some of this might just be a credit to the organization as a whole, right? Like the fact that they're able to run – some of these guys off the bench or insert guys into the starting lineup. Like Duncan Robinson was like out of the rotation completely for the majority of the season. Mm -hmm. And instantly, as soon as he's needed in the playoffs, like he's back and he's doing what he needs to do. Like the fact that he can come in and give him 21 minutes, he hit three threes didn't have his greatest shooting night, but like he can give you quality shooting minutes. Um, and even in this game, he had a big three there down the stretch just to keep it tight. Um, you know, in the last, last 30 seconds of the game. So, um, yeah, I think a lot of that probably has to do with just the way they construct their rosters, able to find value in a lot. I think they have seven undrafted guys on their roster. Um, so front office does a great job in, in finding talent. Heat culture is definitely a real thing. Um, like, again, the ability for somebody, like I said, with Duncan Robinson to be out of the rotation and, you know, stick with it and not like mentally check out now that his number is called, like he's back to contributing in a big way for them. 
is a testament to, you know, like their, their coaching staff, their culture. I'm sure guys like, you know, UD there in the locker room, probably staying in everybody's ear, you know, being the vet that he is. Um, I think all of those things play a factor, you know, into just this team understanding, like, again, here we are, they were a few minutes away from losing the playing tournament and are, you know, knotted up with the Knicks, you know, going, stole home court from them, um, you know, going back into Miami in the second round with the chance to go into the Eastern Conference Finals if they can get out of the series. So um, I think it's just, uh, like I said, a combination of a lot of things, but a lot of credit has to go to Spolster and just his ability to just get guys in the right spots, um, you know, when they're needed. Like even Caleb Martin had four four threes in this game, 22 points. Um, I said we already, you know, gave Vincent Max Struess having a big game. K Love has had a huge impact this entire postseason. Yeah. Cleveland probably could have still used him. Honestly. <laughs> he stayed there. Yeah. So they just – they're just so – I don't know. It's just you so can never much. count out these 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 well run teams, these good organizations, especially with great coaching. Like I feel like, like you can never you just never can count them out. You know what I mean? Even when they're a little short handed, even when they don't have the best like roster constructed, just like they're so well run. It's just they're always gonna put up a fight at the bare minimum. They're always gonna put up a fight. They're never gonna be an easy out. So yeah, it's yeah, it's it's tough, man. If I was a Knicks fan, it's definitely tough. We got to see the health of Jimmy Butler moving forward, but um. Yeah, if he if he can come back a hundred percent, it's definitely definitely looking a little bit scary for them. Yeah, I think moving forward, like they got to find a better way to attack that zone because that is, I think it gave them a lot of problems in the first half. Was a lot of the reason why they were able to Miami stayed in the game for the whole game really, but especially in like the first three quarters is just like their offense wasn't doing phenomenal, but like they're just maintaining getting stops. Um, and, and trying to do their best they can at making them work out of the zone. Definitely down the stretch, we saw a lot more of, of swing passes from the Knicks. Um, they are doing their best to try to get Jalen or, or Julius. They're kind of at that free throw spot and be able to facilitate out of there, um, try to, you know, add some additional stress. So um, I'm sure Tibbs will figure something out moving forward, but they got to gotta try to figure out a way to keep Miami out of this, this zone. But seems like Jimmy's going to be back for game three, so – that's a whole different beast in and of itself. You got Michael Jordan coming back to the court. So I was about to say back with a vengeance too. Yeah. Back when he was smiling at the Knicks fans. Talking right. to him. Yeah. I don't know. I would not be trying to poke him right now. No, no absolutely not. That's the last, that is the last guy I want to get riled up. Absolutely not. Knowing what we know now, right. With it being a one, one series going to Miami. If Jimmy's back healthy, right. Like, or even not hundred percent, but he's back playing for the rest of the series. What what would your prediction be now that with the way that the series stands? The way it is now, I feel like if he comes back 100%. Even if he's 80%, 85%, where he's back, he's playing. At this point, Miami has – listen, they have earned my faith. Listen, I have full trust in playoff Jimmy. I have full tr- – I always had trust in Eric Spolster. I always knew he was a great coach. But mm-hmm. just, like I said, just the way they've been playing, just the way they've improved as a team when the playoffs came around, it's like, they're they're feeding off this whole playoff Jimmy thing. It's been the playoff heat. Like they're all rising to the moment. So right now, and especially the fact that they stole game one going back to Miami, my my faith is in the heat right now. Yeah, I agree. Honestly, if Jimmy's able to come back, I need to see something from the Knicks. Cause like I said, this last yesterday's game gave me just a little bit of doubt. I think I had the Knicks before in this series, but um, Jimmy's able to come back. They're going to be in Miami, hopefully, um, if he's able to come back. But regardless, you're going to be the next two games in Miami. Um, without Bam even really having a huge, you know, offensive presence from a, a scoring perspective, I think he had, you know, 15, 8, and 6 last night. Um, but I said, you know, being in the zone, deterring as much as he can at the rim, like ton of ton of times where he was able to switch out, you know, kind of guard perimeter guys who are trying to drive in. Um, and wall them off. So, you know, he's having a big impact on this series. Um, it doesn't feel like it's going to go much longer. And if Jimmy comes back, right, like you're inserting however much he's putting up PPG, right, another 30, 35 points mm-hmm. um, into the lineup. So it's tough. It's tough. It's hard to watch, um, you know, Emmanuel quickly kind of 
lose his entire role after such a good right. series. Seasons and they had you know six man of the year candidate. He played ten minutes last night and both the box score. That's been like real interesting because it's like as soon as you get RJ Barrett to step up, it's like now Emmanuel quickly is like dropping down. So it's like if you if you were able to get both those guys producing like at the same time, I feel like they'd be a lot better off. But like you said, the Knicks just hasn't shown me anything to make me like believe in them to win this series. You know what I mean? Like the fact that they really were struggling to beat a Jimmy list, Tyler Hero list team, it's just tough. Like and with Bam not really playing like amazingly, it's just. I don't know. They haven't really shown me anything for me to like pick them to win this series right now. Yeah, and I know Obi had a good game in game one. I think he had four or five, you know, threes. Shot like eleven of them. Um, only had ten minutes last night. Um, I said quickly had nine minutes. He's kind of minutes have declined throughout the entire playoffs. He's looked kind of erratic and you know he's moving too fast um, for his own good. So that's another tough thing for the Knicks. Like they're scoring off the benches. Like that was their big punch, and that's kind of you know that's gotten weakened. Um, yeah, they like they got to figure out again. Like I said something to do with the zone because I think if they aren't able to put up points without Jimmy, with Jimmy coming back and the effort that he's going to bring, it's only going to get harder. You're inserting another elite level defender, um, and having him and Bam on the floor at the same time with guys like Kyle Lowry who's again another savvy you know veteran defender. Like it just gets harder and harder for this team to score. Um, so yeah, honestly, I don't the way the series is going, I don't see it going longer than six games, maybe. Um I'd, yeah, I'd say I'd say if I was to predict, I'd say heat and six. Right. I would probably so I, say I feel like they can win one more. The Knicks can win one more. I'm probably going back to back to the game. right. Um, but yeah, like Brunson has had a great series so far, so We'll see. Maybe he, I, he might really need to tap into another gear. Like 30 might not be enough, you know, like mm -hmm. it might have to be more. Um, so, yeah, that's been a, a interesting series. The Heat have been the team of the playoffs <laughs> so far. It's like watching a Cinderella story in March Madness. <laughs> if if you didn't watch any of the regular season, you didn't know any of the seedings and you just watched the games, the Heat has looked like with Jimmy Butler looked like the best team in the playoffs in the number one seed. Like not Boston. Boston's had their lapses. Yeah. We'll get into that. But the Heat has looked like the best team in the East right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And they look like they might have the best player in the NBA. Like you said, you haven't watched. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Think this guy is the next Michael Jordan for real. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, he just brought up Boston. We can go ahead and get right into their game one. Um, obviously, look, caveat, I was in Denver um, at the Nuggets game as that game was, you know, basically wrapping up in the second half. So I only caught whatever glimpses they had on in the uh, in the arena. Went back mm -hmm. and rewatched some of it, but didn't get to see really any of it live. They did pull up on a jumbotron in the arena the last, like, 30 seconds. So we did the whole arena got to react to James Harden's <laughs> game winner, um, which also randomly Jason Tatum was getting booed <laughs> by the Nuggets crowd, which is that's, so, that's <laughs> the most random that's thing about. in the world. Like what? What is he Bro doing? Got the what ball did he do to Denver? <laughs> I don't know. It wasn't like at that point in time, there's maybe like five, six thousand people kind of like it still was like an hour before tip at that point. Um, he got the ball and just Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> like, but that's, I'm so like that's so random. Like Jason Tatum, with they don't like him in Denver or something. That's so random. I don't know, but but Jimmy hit the or not Jimmy when when James hit the shot. Uh, whole arena kind of all people that were in there. You kind of just heard like oh oh. <laughs> um, so obviously he had a career playoff night. Um, from really like even at his time in Houston, like people have kind of tried to speculate like this may be his most impressive playoff performance, just what the circumstances on the road, no Joel, um, like being able to kind of look like turn the clock back um, and, and provide that crazy offensive output that he was doing during his MVP years in Houston. Um, and they go without their, the MVP, not even their mm -hmm. the league MVP, you know, shout out to Joel for that. Um, but and they steal game one on the road against a, a Boston team who, like we, like you said, has had their lapses and their ups and downs throughout the season and has continued here in the postseason. Like we saw it dropping some of those games to Atlanta. Um, and they dropped game one here 
um, in the second round against Philly. Yeah, it's um, it's it's real. Honestly, it's real confusing with the Celtics because, like, I, I will say so. Both teams I watched pretty much this whole game. Both teams like were very very hot. It felt like like both teams were hitting their shots. They were hitting a lot of threes. Um, and it was just weird because like like I'll say Jalen Brown for instance, he started the game. I think he had fourteen points in the first quarter. He ended with twenty three, which isn't terrible. But it's like he only shot. He didn't. He didn't shoot many shots later in the game. He had ten shots in the whole game. Yeah, like that, he can't have. He has to have more than ten shots. Um, Jason Tatum had it going, obviously, but like, I mean, I guess it's credit to the Sixers. They were playing really, really well. James Harden obviously had a had a great game, but even like DeAnthony Milton, he stepped up. He had a good game. Tobias Harris hit some big shots. Max hit some big shots. But my main thing is just the Celtics are a really weird team. Like, I really don't know what to make of them sometimes because they can look like the clear cut title favorites, the clear cut best team in the league. Like one minute. And then the next minute, it completely switches to where, like, they look like they don't know what they're doing. They're turning the ball over constantly. They're making just me- – they're having mental lapses, just making mistakes. Like, even the play that – when he turned the ball over to, to Maxi, I'm just like, like, what are you doing? Like, <laughs> like, I'm, like I'm so confused. I'm like, what is that? Like Watching bro. that play back was like, bro. <laughs> like, what's the plan? A, that's like you're at, like uh... – was like I had like the playground or whatever, and it's like you just you forget who's on your team. Like he was on your team last right. game. He just threw it to him. Was like, oh my god! Right. Like, bro, I just hit, him, hit Maxi dead in the chest. It's like, bro, right. where were you throwing the ball? Yeah. So like that, it's just confusing to me because I really don't know what to make of this team. Obviously, they're they're still a really good team, but it's just these mental lapses, these mistakes late into this game is like it can really end up costing them. Like mm-hmm. it, it could, obviously it cost them this game, which is a, I feel like is a terrible loss. No Joel. Um, at home, I feel like that's a really bad loss for them. But these mental lapses, even if they say they make it out of this series, they go into the next one, or they go to the finals. Like that could really catch up to them. So, um, I don't know if it has something to do with coaching. I see a lot of Celtics fans, a lot of just people in general, complain that um the coaching has just been really bad, or just it hasn't been good, obviously, as last year. So I don't know if that's the case, but they just they they really need to tighten up. Yeah, I mean. I, I saw that same thing too, right? Like people comparing Missoula to to Ime and saying like, oh, this wouldn't have happened under, you know, Ime. But I also saw the same amount of people. And I, I wouldn't agree. Like I would say it's at the end of the day, like a lot of it has to do with like, again, <laughs> Joe Missoula is not on the court throwing the ball to Tyrese Maxey. Right. <laughs> right. Like these types of like focus lapses, um, like that's just kind of been the Sixers for the last couple of years. Um and, like, at the end of the day, right, like, their top players are still younger, right? Like, as long as it's felt like the both of them have been in the league, like, they're still relatively young in terms of NBA years. Um, so, you know, that's to be expected to some extent. But, like you said, these, these focus lapses were happening last year with, you know, with Ime. Um, so, I don't think it's as much of a coaching thing as it's just, like, they got to, you know, mature and understand, like, as good as y'all are when y'all are good, y'all have some low lows. And the further that you get in the playoffs, these low lows will bite you. And it can't get worse than this, where it's like this almost felt like a freebie, right? Like no Joel coming into this game should just be able to just kind of, you know, get this one done. Um, instead, you're now lost home court for the series. Joel got the MVP, so, you know, he's juiced. Mm-hmm. And he said he's coming back for game two. And they're going to look to take a big 2-0 lead. Uh, is it to, it's tonight, right? That's tonight, yeah. yeah. I, honestly, I didn't even know he was coming back for game two. I, the, my thought process going in before you just told me that was, even to say he's not ready for game two, he has the freedom, um, <clears throat> excuse me, to, like, sit out this game. Right. Get, get a little bit more rest and then come back for game three. Because they already really got the job done as far as, like, what you want to do as a road team. Mm-hmm. So, still want to uh, – on the way – on the road, excuse me. But – um. Yeah, it's just – it's tough. And going back to what you said about the fact that they're still young, I feel like a lot of people are just frustrated at the fact that, yeah, I agree they're young as far as, like, age and as far as, like, the years in the NBA. But I feel like, like, Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown, most of the time they're in the league. They've been in the playoffs. They've been on deep playoffs. They've been, here, they've yeah. been to the conference finals. They've been to the finals, obviously, last year. So it's just tough. Um, If I was a Celtics fan, I would understand the frustration as far as, like, keep seeing these same – mental lapses these same it seems like dumb turnovers these see these same late game mistakes so yeah. i can definitely see where the frustration is a little bit no yeah and like 
I don't really want to give them an excuse. Like that's just me trying to like piece together what I think it could be. Mm-hmm. But like, like you said, at the end of the day, as young as they may be in terms of how much like actual age, like since they've been in the league, they're in the conference finals their rookie year. Exactly. Right? Like they're in the finals last year. They've been in the playoffs every year, you know, have been contenders for the last few years now. Like it reaches a point where it's like, y'all have been here. It can't keep happening. Right. Cause you see the, like the teams that are wired that way, they don't make those mistakes, at least not at the consistent amount that the Celtics seem to make it, especially throughout the whole year. And as we've already seen in this playoffs, like you're able to get away with it against a Hawks team, but if that Hawks team was better, that's a whole different series. Cause even in the elimination game, it was close all the way down the stretch. And you know, a couple of things go, you know, differently in that game. And obviously that's, you know, complete hypothetical, but like you might be looking at a game seven in a series that you probably should have got out of in four or five, right? Like, right. Um, so to your, to your point, right? Like that can't continue to happen as a Celtics fan. That can't continue to happen, um, you know, for them if they have aspirations of getting back to the finals. Um, again, already dropping one to the Sixers team without Embiid. Um, I think he said after they announced the MVP and everything, like he did this whole dramatic like turn to his team was like, nah, I'm coming back game two. Um, I could definitely see, um, and honestly, I'm surprised that it's not going to happen. Like with what they're reporting the injury is, right? Like he tore his LCL or sprained his LCL, whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, any type of ligament damage, right? Like especially for a big guy, you would want as much time um, to rest as possible. So I look, he already said he's coming back, but I would strongly, strongly consider if he's not like 90, 95%, just sit out. Like, like you said, even it, if it they lose hurt. the next game, like the series was already like, I felt <clears throat> most people expected to go seven games, right? Like six or seven games minimum. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the fact that you, you got home court, like you've done your job for the road trip. Like if you just take the extra couple of days of rest, um, I think they have a third day of rest, whatever, because of the, the travel between Boston and Philly. So, um, like, take as much rest as possible because, and after the series, you still got to go through, no matter who comes out of Miami and, and New York, it's going to be a scrappy physical series. We need you for that because then actually he's going to have to take on whoever comes out of the West. It's like the road ahead is still long. Um, mm-hmm. You can't, you know, be out here blowing your tires out in round two. Um, when again, we've already accomplished the biggest goal, which is you just want to get one of these first two on the road. Right. And if it's not needed, I feel like I feel like if they had lost this game, then I could understand him saying, like, no, I want to go. I want to play game two. I want to steal one. But it's like, I mean, the same thing we talked about with the Warriors. I feel like they're not losing the second game. I feel like they just won't allow themselves to lose another one at home. Like you could say the same thing for Boston, regardless of whether NB comes back or not, that they they know they blew the first game. They know they need to win this one like at home. So it's like, do you really want to come back, possibly still lose? And it's like you could have got the extra rest. So um I, I feel like he should sit out, but I mean if he wants to if he wants to play. If he feels like he's comfortable enough to play, then I, I mean I guess I can't I, I shouldn't tell him not to, but I I just think it would be smarter if he didn't play this game and then played in game three. Yeah. No, I, I agree. Um gotta shout out a couple of the sixers that stepped up. P.J. Tucker had another almost 40-minute game, and the man didn't shoot anything. No free throw, no jump shot, field goal, nothing. Um, and it was a plus six on the night. Just the still pure impactful. effort. Still Junkyard impactful, dog. Man. Yep. Um, <laughs> One of the best role players of our generation, man, P.J. Tucker. Just a winner. I I almost want to say he is the best role player. Of he like has the a case. No, decade. seriously, he really has a case to be. Like I feel like wherever he goes, he contributes. And it, like even if it's not through scoring, obviously it's these hustle plays, these rebounds, like defense. So PJ Tucker is a is a solid role player. Yeah, and he, he's not like isn't he like really really old? Like I don't remember how old PJ Tucker. He, is. he has to be like he got to be like thirty eight. Yeah, like he has to be like thirty seven. Old, old. Damn. Oh, yeah, actually, he turns thirty eight. Two days. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's old, man. Yeah. Oh, my God. But, um, yeah. yeah, and you look at his assignments, like, every every place he goes, right, like, he's always going to be taking on that top guy, right? Like, mm-hmm. 
was there guarding KD just a couple years ago when KD is, you know, dropping 50 in Brooklyn. Um, now here he is in Philly, going to have to be checking, you know, Tatum and, and Jalen Brown. It's like he's always going to be willing to take on the worst, hardest assignment on defense and does not want anything on the offensive end. Like he'll shoot it if it's there, but he's never, like, never going to hear him complain. He doesn't need shots. He doesn't want his shots if he doesn't have to take them. Like just the consummate pro, like the exact role player that any team would want, like just does all the dirty work. Um, got a shout out Paul Reed too, came in without Joel and got himself a double double um, with 10 and 13. Um, and DeAnthony Melton, five of six from three off the bench, um, he was 25 huge. minutes. He's been like honestly an underrated pickup for all of the NBA, really, just how seamlessly it's felt like he's been able to fit in um, for the Sixers and provide them, you know, in nice where he started, um, quality shooting. Um, and a really, really good, you know, perimeter defender, great at, you know, with active hands, getting in the passing lane. So he's definitely been a steal um, for the Sixers team and is coming up huge for them in the playoffs. But, yeah, Celtics, like, they got their hands full. Like, if this is the only hardened game that we're going to get for this series, like, of this type, like, it was needed. Um, That's all they needed out of him. Right. Especially if Joel comes back, they don't need him to score 45 points again. That They just needed it for this game, and that's exactly what they got. All right, so at the end of the day, you gotta get this man his flowers. One of the greatest scorers ever. Um, right. And he turned back the clock real quick, real quick. That's a little throwback performance and, and got it done for Philly. Um, gonna go over. I think the last series you haven't touched on, right? Is just the Denver Sun series, right? Yeah, because they're they're all in round two. Yeah, I think so. Well, shoot, I'm gonna go to go to quick quick story time about. <laughs> My experience oh yeah, yeah. let us game. yeah let us know let us know what's happening what what happened at the game how First was your experience all, I should say bro so I'm right we're there we're like pre gaming at a bar or whatever getting ready to go to the game I'm thinking I'm like all right normally I get to an NBA game you want to get there like half hour early whatever make sure everything good you want to get food drinks whatever cool sit down get in your seats like right before tip off I'm like it's the playoffs they're playing Phoenix. Let me get there earlier, right? So I was like, I'll try to get there like an hour, hour 15 early. It's, this, it's an 8.30 tip. You get to the arena at like 7, 7, 10. Jumping outside. It got like a drum line. People were selling knockoff T-shirts and hats all over the place. <laughs> um, also, shout out Ball Arena. They had the, That was the fastest thing I've ever got through, like whatever, a little security and like checking in with your ticket. Like the whole thing mm. was like, uh, robotic like you go through you drop your phone walk through the metal detector good and then like you literally just like scan your ticket or like tap your phone and they have turnstiles like a subway so literally like mm. they just have a mad of them set up and they just have like three actual people just watching um but you don't have to like deal with any people you just like go tap your ticket and walk through so um that was super quick like, like i said they were playing the the Sixers game on a jumbotron, man. This is like an hour before tip. Stands are already starting to fill up. There's already probably like six, five, six thousand people um, already getting to their seats. With like, by the time the players are like warming up on the court, the state, the arena is like ninety percent of the way packed. Um, and then, obviously, like the pregame is on like another level. Everybody got uh, like rally towels and stuff. Um, and they have the whole like hype video going, like the <laughs> atmosphere from before the tip, like for, like once the starting lineups are getting announced, is like it's on another level. Like if when you go to an NBA game and you get to those like, oh, it's tight, you know, down the stretch, like two minutes left, like and the crowd really gets into it. That's what it felt like when it's like they're announcing the starters. <laughs> that, is, that is so crazy, bro. Oh, uh, I... see it. The the crowd in Denver was electric like i was looking around like while that was going on i got videos and it's like there's not a single empty seat from the jump which is like they are making the fans are making their impact felt on the game it's loud the mascot is getting everybody hype they're running hype videos like in every single timeout like trying to keep the, the energy up um mm -hmm. and i probably stood up like 70 percent of the game just because it's like you can't <laughs> 
you can't sit down, right? Yeah, yeah, um, I feel that. Yeah, you, I mean, it's funny because you, you could tell. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. You could you see good. the like the crowd's energy through the TV. So I know, like, experience that live was probably insane. Bro, the fourth quarter, I don't, I don't think I sat down at all. Like, because they, <laughs> and this is again smart because even at that point in time, like the Suns were up going into the fourth, um, and they ran this like super long hype video as soon as the third quarter ended like they cut the lights in the arena um and ran a whole nother hype video and then ended it with like the mascot like going crazy um and everybody in the arena just stood up and then never sat back down for the rest of the game <laughs> uh and another another funny thing um the, it was like a group of three or four fans in front of me all nuggets fans but i had two or three Suns fans behind me um, and so I'm in the middle of them. The Suns guy behind me, and this is mad respect to him. It's like like Michael Jordan said, real man talk when the score is zero zero when they down. Mm-hmm. He was talking his cash from the get from <laughs> from warm ups. Like yeah, KD, yeah, book. It's looking good tonight. I'm like I respect it. I do. In Denver, I definitely respect it, bro. The Nuggets fans in front of me, wild front runners, bro. When I when uh... I tell you. <laughs> it was like after after the first quarter, the dude behind me left to go get drinks, right? And the guy in front of me turned around. He's like, "That guy behind you, is, he's annoying." And I was I was <laughs> laughing because I'm like, I'm just I'm just here for the vibes. I don't have no right. dog in this fight. Like I just, I'm just here for the atmosphere, bro. Every time the Nuggets would go up, they start turning around. He's clapping in his face. Uh, you gotta be doing that all game, bro. bro. Don't do it only when you up. The third quarter happened, right? Book was getting it going. They're, they're, you know, they take the lead. They kind of maintain the lead for most of the third quarter. Bro, it's crickets in front of me. They're not saying nothing. I kid you not, I think Jokic hit a, like a layup or a floater to take the lead in the fourth. Dude turned around, he in his face like, yeah, they need a timeout. Let's go. I'm like, bro, y'all are phony. <laughs> Bro, you got to talk the same talk when it's 0-0. Zero, zero. When you down, you got to talk the same. You can't be a real trash talker if you're not talking when it's 0-0, zero, zero, bro. Exactly. So that's that's what, funny. At the end of the day, I respect the Suns guy behind me more. Because even, like, at the end of the game when it was, just, you know, like, it was basically over, um, he was like, he's like, that's all right. Well, I'll be back here game seven. <laughs> <laughs> I like him. I like this. Nah. Suns fans, I like him. That's nah, how that's how Dylan Brooks should have been. Dylan Brooks should have been like, listen, <laughs> it don't matter what's going on. You could like, bro, you could destroy me. Like when we playing, I'm still gonna talk. Even after I lose, I'ma still talk, bro. If you're gonna be a real trash talker, you gotta be like that. Yeah, and he was like the guy in front of me was like, I'll I'll will give you my info right now. I'll pay for your parking if it gets to a game seven. You could you could see me here. I was like, bro. <laughs> Y'all are funny. Y'all are funny. That's, lit. That's hilarious. Uh, That's yeah. lit, though. That's real, real lit. Yeah. Overall, the atmosphere was was crazy. Um, the Nuggets fans were – they were in it from the get-go all the way from, like, the upper deck, you know, top nosebleed all the way down to, like, court side. Like, everybody was locked in cheering like crazy. So, you know, huge shout-out to Denver and Ball Arena. that you know, They had that place rocking. But um, to get to the game itself um, – Honestly, I'm a little sad, right? I got to Denver on Saturday night um, and was watching the game on TV and saw Jamal Murray was having, you know, one of those nights. I was mm. hoping I could see one of that in person. And oh, that, yeah. <laughs> that boy that had a stinker. Him and Michael yeah. Porter Jr. had a stinker. Mm. But Jokic took the game over in the most Jokic way possible with some of the <laughs> wildest-looking post Footwork, fall away. Loader. It look goofy in person too, bro. <laughs> bro, I it know the really TV. Do. He be looking. Like, I'm like, bro, how are you scoring, bro? Like, he looks so weird, bro. I'm looking at it. I, my seats were maybe like twenty ish rows off the court behind one of the baskets. So first half, um, the Nuggets were like scoring our way, and I'm watching him back a and down, and it's just like. I'm looking at it, he just be doing the all the little footwork is perfect. Shoulder this way, shoulder this way, foot. Here's the ball, ball fake, spin. And it's like, bro, he is cooking Aiden, like cooking him. Like, like he does with any center in the league. But it's mm-hmm. like to see it like up close, like 
the little intricacies of his footwork. Um, like every single movement is intentional, as goofy as it, it does end up looking sometimes, uh, especially with his jumper. To, that release point is crazy. He's pulling <laughs> it from like back right. here. <laughs> but um, yeah, bro, like he is just, just finessing him to death, really. Like, um, and for the Suns to have lost this game with Jamal Murray having as bad of a performance as he, as he did, with Michael Porter Jr. having as bad, of, as bad of a performance as he did, A is a credit to Jokic, like, his dominance comes in different ways. Like, this is more how you typically see the big guy dominated games, like, giving you almost 40. Um, but in the game before, he had a great game with only 20-something points, but, again, facilitating as he always does for that team. Right. I don't think this series is going more than five. Hey, honestly, I, I, I the way it looks right now, I, I would agree with you. The Suns don't. I mean, we've had these concerns even when they won in five against the Clippers. It mm -hmm. just looked like the way they play is not sustainable. The way they play would not be a team at full strength with a lot of depth. Like they just they have to rely on Kevin Durant, Devin Booker going off playing a lot of minutes they're not they're basically getting nothing from their bench like i'm bro, i'm looking at the box score of the game right now and it looks ridiculous like it's 24 from kevin durant 35 from booker 14 from Aiden. no one else is even in double digits the next closest person is chris paul with eight and he's injured so it's like they're getting nothing from their bench like at all so it, it, it looks pretty bad right now what was funny about watching it from the perspective I was like I'm watching it from like the 2K cam, <laughs> like I'm I'm like behind. Oh, yeah. <laughs> when it was like coming my direction, right? This did the, the uh, Suns were going that way, right? To the opposite basket. Like I had a better view. Their offense is so like it's so linear. Like when Chris Paul has a ball, it's like, okay, Chris Paul's running a pick and roll. Okay. Devin Booker's running a pick and roll. Okay. KD's running a pick and roll. And that's it. And, like, mm -hmm. maybe A, you know, get a post touch here, you know, get a chance for, like, a short little midi, little roll, whatever, especially when Chris Paul was in. And that's something that we touch on a little bit more in depth later, but obviously with his injury, even just watching the game, like, there was a point in the fourth quarter where I sat and thought to myself, like, as soon as Chris Paul left, it felt like Aiden left. But Aiden was still on the court, but, like, it felt like his presence was not there at all. Like, he doesn't – get those same touches when Chris Paul isn't on the court, which is how he's played his whole career. Like Chris Paul always can get his big going. So that is a huge loss for them, not just for losing Paul, but you're going to lose some of the impact that Aiden could have on the offensive end as well. But like watching both of the offenses, like how they operate is completely different. Cause when the, when the Nuggets have it, you're seeing so much motion like Jokic being a screen setter, people coming and running DHOs for Jokic, Jokic will catch it at you know, like in the mid range, guys are running flare screens on both sides, rotating around, backdoor cuts, pin downs, and the sun's getting it's like here, book here, KD. Mm -hmm. Like it's not even a lot of swing passes. Mm -hmm. It really is like a bunch of tough shot making, which they they hit them a lot. Like book again, really had it going there in the third quarter, and was a large reason why um, the Suns kind of were able to, to take a you know pretty much control of the game in that quarter. Um, as he really got hot hitting a bunch of tough mid-ranges, knocked down a couple of threes. But, again, that's not the most conducive way to winning a game. And when you have a team that's as deep as the Nuggets with as many versatile defenders as the Nuggets, like, KD had a bad shooting night. Like, he started mm -hmm. the game, like, like, 0 for 6 or 0 for 7. Like, he missed a lot of looks that KD normally makes, which, again, at the end of the day, a lot of times, right, when you're defending him, like, you just have to hope <laughs> like he, right. he makes it, he makes a lot of them. He misses some of them. Um, but he had a kind of an off night and even with D book having to go in the way that he did. And at the end of the day, like Katie still had 24 D book still had 35. That offense is just so stale. Like it, it just don't, it doesn't have that same flow and motion that the nuggets had. Um, and that was a lot of the reason why they were able to, you know, end up, kind of grinding out this win because I think it was like both teams I think were sub 50 points going into halftime it was like 42 to 44 or something it was like a that. 
ugly. Like that game was ugly. like you said, Murray was missing, Michael Porter Jr. was missing, KD was missing. So it was a it was a real ugly game. Like it wasn't. It was there like, was a point in the game where they put on the jumbotron, like it just was rotating like stats, and it was like mm-hmm. showing both teams three point field goal uh, percentage, and it was it's like fifteen percent to like eleven. Ew, <laughs> so <laughs> gross. Uh, and it finished like the Nuggets shot. 26% from three, Suns shot 19%. So, like, a bad shooting night for both teams. Mm-hmm. Um, so, when shots aren't falling, right, like, the better offense feels like it just is going to be able to get those buckets down the stretch. Like, having the closers like KD and D-Book is great, but Jokic closed that game out better than the both of them were able to. Um, and a huge credit to Mike Malone in this game, like, Michael Porter Jr. basically sat the entire fourth quarter. Like, he only had five points, uh, I think, going into the quarter. He went with who had the hot hand. KCP hit a couple of big threes there in the third quarter. Mm -hmm. He had some huge threes in the fourth to to knock the game up. I think he had the one that that took the lead there in the fourth. Um, So he was huge for them. He rolled with Bruce Brown as well down the stretch, who, again, you know, former teammate of KD, was able to just harass and play good defense. Um, Nuggets defense as a whole has been super impressive the way that they're able to sub in, you know, Bruce Brown, uh, Christian Braun was able to play some quality minutes for them on the defensive side of the ball as well. Um, Aaron Gordon has had a great series so far. He's, he's had a great playoffs this you know, entire postseason already um, on both sides of the ball. You know, he had it going on offense in the first quarter for them, but just his presence on, you know, guarding a lot of the pick and roll action has been great for the Nuggets. So, yeah, I think we both had the Nuggets coming into this series, probably mm-hmm. I think in like six games, but I I honestly be shocked if it goes more than five. Like I'm sure Phoenix can get one at home, but I just that depth that we talked about going into the series is really and obviously mm-hmm. like with the Chris Paul injury is gonna be even more prevalent, but it just like when you're playing Ish Rainwright and Tory Craig and Bismack Biombo, like, yeah, you have guys that can play, but it's not the same as who Denver can put in. Not quality bench players. Like it's right. completely different. Um uh, one thing you said that was real interesting was the fact that you said their offense, like watching it, their offense looks completely different. Not a lot of motion, not a lot of like actual mm-hmm. plays being run. I feel like one thing that a lot of people, probably including myself, because I picked the Suns. I didn't pick them to come out of the West. I just felt like they were kind of the best team in the West, like, before mm-hmm. the playoffs started. One thing that we didn't um, – a lot of people didn't really take into account was the fact that with Kevin Durant being traded to Phoenix and you shipping out a lot of your quality role players, just a lot of your players in general, mm-hmm. the fact that you have to s- switch up your playbook, I feel like. Like, you can't run the same plays that you had before. It's like you got to right. scrap a lot of the plays in the playbook. And – it's just tough. And like, obviously, like you said, it just seems like their offense is your turn, my turn, your turn, my turn. Like, it's it's just tough, especially so late into the season. And the fact that Kevin Durant missed a lot of the time in the regular season, it's like you don't really have the chemistry. You guys can't really practice together. Katie's hurt. So it's like they don't really have a flowing offense. So a lot mm-hmm. of it is just the Devin Book show, the KD show. So I thought that, that was pretty interesting because you can visibly see that when you're watching the game. Like, they don't – like, it's just pick and roll. Your turn, my turn. Yep. Hit a tough midi. And that's even worse because it's like they're both really mid-range shooters. I guess they can shoot threes, but it's like in this game, in this league right now, it's like tough middies ain't really the way to win. Like it's not yeah. really a recipe to success. So um that is, is a real problem. Their death is is visible. Like you can clearly see the Suns look gassed because their guys have to play so many minutes, bro. It's just it, it's tough. I don't know how they're going to do it. And now, like you said, with Chris Paul being out, campaign is still – I don't think he's 100%. He's been dealing with injuries the second half of the season. So That jumper is hideous. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Bo pulled up for a corner three in front of my face, and I think I audibly, like, didn't even mean to, like, say it out loud. I was like, oh, nah. Like, oh, nah, bro. <laughs> and the, the, the Suns fan behind me is like, yeah, what it up, campaign? Wow, break. I'm like, bro. <laughs> this shot is so weird, bro. Like it's like, bro. I can't even explain it, bro. His shot is so gross. Like yeah, it's, it's crazy. How did you make it to, bro? People with bad shots. Sorry to get off track, but like people with bad shots, it's so interesting how you made it to the league shooting so weird. Like Lonzo when he first got into the league, like shooting from your side, 
Like, how do you get to the league like that? That's so crazy. I see somebody did like a breakdown of the worst jumpers in NBA history, and they got to like uh, <laughs> Sean Marion is a crazy one. Uh, nothing I genuinely think is worse than um, Michael Kidd Jokers because he had bro, he oh, used to yeah. shoot his, like his elbow blocking his whole eye. It would bend <laughs> in like it was so gross, bro. His shot was terrible. I don't know yeah. how people make it to the league of these terrible shots, but <laughs> yeah, seeing campaign shot like in my face was like. <laughs> Put that away, bro. But now he's gonna have to be playing like a he, quality he's minutes. Start. For him. He had, but he has to at this point. Yeah. He has to with no Chris Paul. I, honestly, Chris Paul... if I was Monty Williams, I would seriously consider, bro, just put book at the one and just start a Kogi and Tory Craig. Right, like you're already though. running so much ISO pick and roll. Like both of them are capable shooters, right? Like mm. put them out there and just, bro, you, you might as well just. Go all in and just be like, book KD, win us the game. I'm just gonna put shooters around y'all and get it done. I I I agree with what you're saying. It's just tough because it's like now you're asking him because like we said, they're already so reliant on him. They already both have to go out there and score like 30 plus to even have a chance to win. It's mm-hmm. like now you're gonna ask Devin Booker to score 30 plus and also run the offense and also still play defense because we don't have a lot of people that can play defense. So it's like you're putting a lot on his plate and he's a great player, but it's just I don't see that as a recipe for success, and it's tough. Like, it's funny because, like, really all of the concerns that people have for the Suns are showing, like, every right. single one of them. The depth, the reliance on their two stars, and the injuries, all showing at the yeah. same time. So yeah. <laughs> it's, it's tough right now. I don't really right. have a lot of faith in these Suns, but hey, man. This, this AAU style of, like, I'll just get traded <laughs> here. And we're just going to, me and Book, we're just going to carry them. Like, let's just hoop, bro. Like, that's, it's not going to work. Like, and so I see it's funny because it always seems like it's Kevin Durant in the middle of all of this. It's always KD. Look, and yeah. I, I said this in my the first video I posted at the trade deadline is, like we've been talking about, where are they going to have defenders at? Where are they going to get those extra role players at? It sure seems like right now, they could use Mikel and Cam Johnson. Yep. It'd be a lot easier <laughs> to kick it out to one of them instead of Josh Akogi or Tory Craig or <laughs> Damian Lee. Right. And it will be a lot easier to guard the Nuggets with the both of them instead of putting so much onus on KD and D book. Yeah. It's tough, man. Yeah, it's super teams, man. It's just not the way to win. It's oh. not a way to build a team. The last thing I'll say about this game and really this series um, is more, more, it's more so really about the Nuggets as a whole. Um, and I really think this is the best roster that Jokic has had around him. And they're playing at least at their their highest level that they've had since he's really been playing at that that MVP level for the last few years. Um, they are – this depth is scary because, I mean, they have more options off the bench that they don't – they aren't going to right now. They don't need to. But, like, Reggie Jackson is on this team. He's been getting DMPs. Um, Zeke Naji played for them. You know, Payne Watson had minutes as a rookie, like kind of similar to Christian Bond, just like a guy that can come off the bench and, like, just – be a hustle guy um so yeah, and you know thomas bryant is there <laughs> right if they ever needed him i forgot honestly i forgot about him <laughs> i forgot about him bro yeah. gotta love gotta love his dmp <laughs> coach's decisions after one or more minutes um, he could be playing right behind ad and ahead of gabriel right now I was like, nope, he he took minutes. We, we really could have used him bro we really could have used him but he uh, wanted more minutes so whatever but, but yeah, look, the way that Jokic is playing right now, the way that this team is playing, I, I'm sure, you know, Murray obviously has had an off night, but we've seen from him in the first round and in game one of the series, like, he's a legit playoff riser. Um, and whoever, if they're able to close out the series, as we're both kind of expecting to, like, whichever of the Warriors or Lakers they get in the next round, like, that is going to be a phenomenal series. <laughs> Um, yeah, that's gonna be a great one. And Shokic is just honestly, look at this point. I, I want to just be 
Denver and the Lakers just so I can watch Jokic and AD go at it. Because if they keep playing at the level that they're at, boy, we're going to be in for some crazy. Yeah. That, can you imagine? Can you imagine this? The Western Conference Finals will be a battle between Jokic and AD going at it. No matter who wins, and they'll come out of it and possibly get like an MVP. Like you met, like <laughs> really see who the best big man in the league is. Like really go through the gauntlet. Like that, yeah. that would be insane. But um, yeah, yeah it's just it's been crazy. Nuggets are playing really well. I'm not gonna lie, they've been playing great. Um, Lakers and four that will scrape the Nuggets. I'm not even <laughs> come on now. Like, we're gonna beat them, but nah. All jokes aside, though, they, they've been playing really well. Like I said, we're we're definitely they definitely feel like they're gonna get past the Suns. Um. It's going to be a great matchup, like you said, regardless of who comes out of this here between the Lakers and the Warriors. But um, one thing I will like to say, I, I just I just, I can't get past this, what I was saying. I'm not a fan of DeAndre Ayton. I'm really not. Like, he's just – bro, I just don't like DeAndre Ayton, bro. Like, he's just – he's big, but he doesn't really defend great, but he doesn't really rebound great, but he's – and he's kind of soft. Like, I'm just not a fan of DeAndre Ayton. Like, he's just – he just he seems like he's he's seven foot on accident. Like he really wants to be a guard or something. Like he wants to be on the wing. Like he's not he doesn't play like a big man. He seems like he's big for no reason. Like I just I gotta get that off my chest. I just I'm not a fan of DeAndre Ayton, honestly. The way that Jokic was able to just like catch it on like the elbow high block and just like hmm, 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 and is under the rim in like two, three dribbles is it's too easy, right? Like, I, he did that, like, one or two times, and I turned to my girl. I was like, nah, bro, he's too soft. Like, he's way <laughs> too soft. And it's um, not like, I, we don't even need you to go, like, obviously, you don't have to stop Jokic, but, like, you seen that clip of that, that was going around with him when the ball's getting tipped up in the air, and he's just standing under the basket. Like, Jokic is, like, tipping it back and forth. It's like him and KD trying to fight for the rebound, and, Jokic, and Aiden is just standing there. Yeah. Like, he doesn't play like a big man. Like, it's just, it's frustrating. Right, and that's what, that's what we said in, in the last episode coming into the series, is, like, Aiden is going to be huge. Either way, however the series go, goes, a lot of it is going to be on his shoulders because you're going to have the toughest matchup and, again, have the ability to potentially put some additional stress on Jokic because no one else on the court can check you. You are taller than everybody. Right. Right? Like, and you're losing both of those battles. And, again, I, like I said, I think a, a large part of that is Chris Paul getting hurt, like, but I said, as soon as he left the game, and it's hard, like, in the arena, like, we literally just saw him, like, walk off into the tunnel. And, like, we don't know what's happening until, like, I get, a, like, a Shams notification on Twitter, like, he's got mm-hmm. groin tightness or whatever it was. <clears throat> um, but it's like, as soon as he left, it felt like Aiton, like, ceased to be on the court, realistically. Like, he just was a body. Um, so, yeah, that's been my thing with Aiton – for since he's been in the league, like we're reached the point, like it's been a good amount of seasons now. Like you've got to get more aggressive. Like again, like you said, like it's Jokic. Like you're not gonna stop Jokic. You don't stop the most dominant bigs, but like you have to do something to contain them. Or mm-hmm. especially in Jokic's case, like at least try to make him work on the defensive side of the ball. Because at the same time, like he can't get into foul trouble. Like you can take it at him because he can't, if he gets into foul trouble, like that's a huge way bigger of a loss for the nuggets. than if you got into foul trouble, right? Like, right. Um, so he, I don't know if we're going to get it. I just don't think it's it within him right now to like tap into that. But like you said, sometimes it does feel like he's just big for no reason. Cause he's just out there again, tossed around, bro. Like, <laughs> body in him there was a couple of times where Jokic literally like backed him under the basket and there was sometimes Jokic is kicking it out from there I'm like bro if that was Joel oh my gosh that's like <laughs> like yeah, man. getting yammed on it's pretty bad honestly like... it's, it's speaking of that just something that I thought about last night but the NBA has gotten out of control with like posters and getting dunked on like the Gary Payton dunk Facts. on LeBron, bro. Like, thank bro, you, bro. Thank you. Oh my god! I'm like, he didn't like, dunk on LeBron, bro. He dunked it. Like, yes, LeBron was there, but that's not a like. They said I forgot what they actually said, but it was something like 
he like he posterized bro. He said something crazy right. like that. I'm like, bro, it is it was not the way you're making the scene, bro. It made right. it seem like he it was like Ja Morant cocking it back. Yeah, like bro, he made it seem like it was Ja Morant cocking it back, jumping over him or something. Like it was it wasn't that deep. That, they right. get out of here with that. I don't want to discredit it because again, I used to at the end of the day, LeBron jumped, he was there, like it wasn't a open dunk, <laughs> but I wouldn't even say it was like a contact dunk. That's like no. I don't want to put it in 2K terms. It's like, bro, you jump, you ain't neither of y'all got an animation. He just got the dunk ball, right? Like, Literally, <laughs> like you just you just put your hand up, like it was a little bump, but it wasn't like you didn't get dunked on. That was crazy. Yeah, I thought that like, too. As soon as I was watching, I was like, bro, what? <laughs> I put that, I wrote that down, I put that in my notes because I was like, it's gotten out of control, like this. Everybody trying to every time somebody fall, you want to step over them. Every time you dunk at somebody in the area, everybody want to tap their head. The bench is going crazy. I'm like, save it for when it actually matters. Like in this this right. Denver game, Jeff Green caught a body, and it's crazy because I'm looking back at it, that was his only bucket of the game. Wow! <laughs> um, but like he was, that was when it was coming in front of me, and um, like he he dunked it. I don't remember who jumped. Somebody jumped in the way. And got yammed on whole crowd, got out they see. I screamed. I was like, yo, oh <laughs> gosh. Like, <laughs> um, but like that is a poster. Like he somebody mm-hmm. jumped in his way and he finished through the contact. Right. Not somebody jumped on your side, didn't even really go up that high. Like, not a lot of contact, and you still got the dump off. I don't even like honestly, and I might be in a minority on this. I don't even really I see why it's called a poster when people get a put back poster. But like even that, though, I feel like it's like the guy's back is turned. He's like boxing out. He's jumping to get a rebound, and you come from behind and dunk on him. Like technically, yeah, it's a poster, but it's like it's not the same as if the guy was turned around trying to block your shot and you dunk on him. I feel like those are two different things. Yeah, a hundred percent. Because like <clears throat> it's a it's different when like you're making the decision to be like I'm jumping to try to block this shot. Like, right. When, like. And the bigs that do that consistently, like the first one that always comes to mind for me is Yaka because Ja banged on him twice already. Yeah. But it's like both times he's been like, I see you coming. I'm about to try to block this. And whatever mm-hmm. happens, happens. And like you take that risk. Like those are actual posters, like something that you would print out and put up on your wall. <laughs> right. <'cause it's> impressive. <laughs> right. No one is about to take it besides Mary, maybe Gary Payton, because he got a dunk with LeBron in the picture. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but like nobody's about to be printing that out and putting that up in their crib. Like it's nah, not a bro. poster. <laughs> but yeah, like yeah, that that kind of bugged me when I was watching on the broadcast and it was going crazy. I was like, it ain't it's cool, cool for him. You, right, bro, it's his nice little dumb. Didn't even care that much. You beat, yeah, you <laughs> beat. That, bro, Gary Payton sitting there like this. He like, like he don't care. Like he knew it wasn't no poster. That, that killed me. That was funny. Commentaries was funny with that one. We gotta we gotta clip that and make it uh the thumbnail with all of us just like this and put Gary Payton in the middle of the screen. <laughs> but Yo. yeah, the NBA and celebrations have gotten out of control. Out of control. Um but I do want to get to this because this came out a couple of days ago. The ringer's been doing this. I think they started it like in December or something like that ranking the top 125 players and they've been <clears throat> updating it like once a month and they're updating it throughout the playoffs so they updated it on Sunday I think and I just want to I'm just going to peruse through and see what uh what catches my eye what your thoughts are obviously one of the ones that's kind of been making the rounds on Twitter and the first one I'm going to start at is the the bottom tier right the 125th best player according to them in the league being D'Angelo Russell <laughs> Um, and just off the rip, right, the next five players in front of him, who would you take over D'Lo, right? Just – this is just overall. First right. one is Grant Williams. D'Lo. I could honestly see an argument. It, well, it depends on what I need. It depends on what I need, though. Yeah. Like, these are two, two completely different players, but I'll take D'Lo. Grant Williams has had, like, way less of an impact for the Celtics this year than he had last year. So, like, we're yeah. going to strictly right now. Taking D'Lo, mm-hmm. Malik Monk. I probably taking Malik. Ah, Monk. <laughs> I'm about to say Malik. I don't know. Malik Monk is kind of nice. Again, it depends on what I need. He's a just a straight scorer, but the, I, the way he's been playing, I'll probably take Malik Monk. Markel Fultz. Come on, I'm taking D'Lo. He's been he was playing well this season. I'm not going to yeah. discredit him. He's been playing very well, but I'm taking D'Lo. Okay. 
<laughs> and this is, wait, hold on. This isn't this isn't like moving forward. This is just like right now. Like yeah. Better. Okay. I think it. I'm pretty sure that's how they've been doing <clears> it. Yeah. Um. <laughs> next one is crazy, bro. Dylan Brooks. You're li- there's no you're lying. There's no bro. way he's ahead of him. <laughs> and the God, they got him at the 121st best player in the NBA. But the write up says, the write up says an undeniable two way player for better or worse. What? Forget D'Lo. He's better than Malik Monk. <laughs> like he, what? Bro, there are people that's not on this list. That should be on this list that Dylan Brooks is behind to me. Like, I, I always see, like, I got a bunch of Rockets people mm-hmm. on my Twitter. Like, Jalen Green didn't make this list. <laughs> Off of what I just saw from Dylan Brooks, like, again, this was updated on Sunday. Coming out of that Lakers series, it's no way. It's no way. Bro, there's no shot. He should even be the top 150, 175. Bro, no. Get Dylan Brooks out of here. Bro. I'm not hearing that. <laughs> I'm not hearing it. Bro, the Grizzlies don't even want him. Grizzlies said under no circumstances are we bringing you back. None. What is your actual thoughts on that? Because I, <laughs> when I read the tweet, I looked at it, and I was like, bro, have you ever seen an NBA organization? Because somebody in there, like, went and leaked to Shams or whoever. They mm-hmm. get these behind-the-scenes sources and, like, had to have told him, like, bro, he is gone. It's nothing. I don't care if the whole <laughs> roster – retire tomorrow we're not bringing him <laughs> back like that's a crazy thing to say right like, yeah that was that was a little extra um i've seen a lot of people saying that they feel like they kind of using him as a scapegoat they for are this season which i i i see a little bit because they have a lot bigger problems than dylan brooks like jot like literally was in a strip club with a gun like <laughs> they had a lot of they had a lot of cultural problems over yeah. there so Dylan Brooks, he's played bad. He didn't help because he played bad. He talked a lot of junk. Couldn't back it up. They got, I'm not destroyed, but, like, they got handled. They got handled, basically, in the first round. Clapped. So, yeah. I was trying to be nice, but, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they got handled in the first round. But he, he he definitely didn't help himself. But, like, making it seem like he was the whole problem when I feel like, not even just with the team, I feel like going from coaches in the organization, they have a whole cultural problem over there, like, I've seen like some like people talk people in the media talk about the Grizzlies saying that like they kinda let the players do whatever they want. That's basically how Jaws doing whatever he wants, basically. They have a lot of freedom over there. So I feel like as an organization, they have a lot of cultural problems. So the mm-hmm. fact that they just pinned it all on Dylan Brooks and was like, basically we're gonna make you the face of everything and we're gonna ship you away. And not everyone's just talking about Dylan Brooks. So they're kinda using him as a scapegoat, like the fall guy, I would say. Yeah, which is kinda I- it's tough. I and it's wild because I don't agree with Kendrick Perkins a lot, but I know that he said, um, and what he said was true. Like he was like, Dylan Brooks has been a part of this young core with Jod for as long as they've been in the league, right? Like mm-hmm. he's been a part of what Memphis has done since the beginning of this whole kind of you know group that they put together. <laughs> and again, he didn't even have the biggest off the court issue <laughs> for this this season. <laughs> right like how is it that that's the immediate move that feels like okay we got to get rid of him um so yeah it felt crazy excessive and kind of unprofessional for them to be like under no circumstances can is he coming back to that part team? that part was crazy like under no circumstances <laughs> like doesn't matter you're not coming back that part is crazy do i disagree I, with it though no, no, but you don't no. say it like that. <laughs> exactly. You don't have to be so unprofessional and say under no circumstances. Like right. I feel like it, they was kind of sending a message to the rest of the team too. Like, I right, like we're changing things from here on out. Like this is going to be a new culture. This is going to be a new team moving forward. As you can see by the way we packed up Dylan Brooks, like got him out of here. But that, yeah. that, that was a little. That was a little bit crazy. Kind of felt was, bad a little bit. I don't even like Dylan Brooks, but that was a little crazy. There was some story I read that somebody tried to compare the situation to, and apparently back in the day. <laughs> Uh, Michael Irvin was like wild and party and whatever. You yeah, saw that, right? Is. And it was mm-hmm. like Troy Aikman went to like man, Jimmy Johnson was a coach and was like, "Oh, we got to do something about Michael Irvin." He was like, "Nah, you don't touch him. Get rid of his friends on the team right. who pulling him into this stuff." He was like a backup um, tight end. Like we're gonna cut him just to show Michael Irvin that we're not playing, but we're not gonna cut you. Like, right? Yeah, that's that's basically that's what they do because obviously they're not getting rid of Ja. Right. They're not gonna do nothing with Ja, but like we gotta show him that like, all right, we mean business moving forward. Right. And 
honestly, while we're here to kind of wrap up Dylan Brooks, like there's going to be interest in him, like around the league, like teams are going to be able to, um, their teams are going to want to sign him um, in free agency, like, like him or hate him at the end of the day, he still is a valuable, you know, defensive player, according to him, has more mm-hmm. in his bag than just being a catch and shoot three and D guy. So I guess it's to be determined if, <laughs> if he can live up to that or not. But the league um, can be sick when he averaged 25 points per game on the, bro, on what the Rockets. If like, <laughs> <laughs> what if he took like a Mikel Bridges type week, like just start bro, crazy? I'd be a fan because I then I'd want you to start talking junk again because that would. You imagine, imagine Dylan Brooks, the same person he is, talking junk, talking crazy, but really, like, is nice, though, yeah. like, backing it all up. That'd be crazy. Be I'd Jimmy be Butler. Very funny. Basically. <laughs> basically. And still locked down on defense. Oh, yeah. I'm here wherever, for it. Dylan Brooks' revenge arc. I'm here for it. Wherever he end up next year, look, they got to put it on national TV whenever he plays Memphis because that's going to be crazy. He oh, better look. God. <laughs> he better start talking again because <laughs> yes. that's going to be must-see. <laughs> Going back to these uh these rankings though, next one they got here, another Lakers guy. They got Austin Reeves at 119 behind uh Bogdanovich in Atlanta, Valanchunas, Gordon Hayward, and Bobby Portis. That feels kind of right, maybe aside. I was about from to say that doesn't Gordon Hayward. Mm-hmm. Probably be the I... one that I would maybe think about the most. That was the only one I had a little bit of like question with. Like the rest of them, like he seemed that's I love Austin Reeves, obviously, as a Lakers fan, but he's he's slightly, slightly overrated when as far as, like, like on mm-hmm. Twitter and, like, as far as, like, the sports media, just because, obviously, he's a Laker. He's plays with LeBron, but that sounds about where he should be. Yeah. Another one here that you – know, I'm just kind of <laughs> scrolling through some of these for the first time. Nick Batum at 112, um, <laughs> ahead of D'Lo. <laughs> a lot That's of these guys wild. down here is kind of – Kind of wild to me. I th- I think um what I'm getting from this list like people's roles on their teams is different from like are you a better player than this person if you get what I'm saying it's like Nick Batum is not a better player than D'Angelo Russell but like honestly even the role he doesn't play his role better than D'Lo right now but I'm just right. saying like he's valuable to the Clippers and he is perfect for what they need out of him so it yeah. seems like he's. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I could see why the – well, whoever does this list would kind of put him up there, but, like, he's not a better player than D'Angelo Russell. Yeah, I could see that. Even, like, the write-up they got here is literally just says, role player extraordinaire with no major holes in his game. There's long, larger paragraphs just about, you know, like, his numbers aren't going to blow anyone away, but, like, every single team would want somebody like Nick Batum up there just because, like, he can shoot, he play defense. Hornets. <laughs> not the Hornets. They don't, want <laughs> they don't want him. That's fair. <laughs> uh, first rookie on the list here at 101 is Walker Kessler, who's one spot behind Jared Vanderbilt, who's one spot behind <laughs> Alex Caruso. What I, what I will say, I honestly, like, let me be honest, I haven't watched a lot of Utah Jazz, so I can't speak too much on Walker Kessler. I don't like, I don't want to speak on something I don't really know too much, but from what I've heard, he's a like, pretty solid player. Like, a really good player. He was better than Gobert this year. Yeah, I've heard that a lot. I think you told me that a lot. Yo, that is so crazy. Uh, that but, play is going to go down as – I don't even want to get into that. That, no, <laughs> that could right be now. a whole separate – Yeah, honestly. I don't even want to get into that right now. Uh, But honestly, though, like, I watched some of him at, at Auburn in college and then coming into to Utah, a lot of people were concerned that, like, his lack of athleticism would like really hinder him way more in the NBA than it did. Like, you can kind of get away with it just being seven one in college, but like mm-hmm. everybody's a little bit bigger, a little bit better in the NBA. Um, and honestly, like he's just is doing everything you would want out of an interior big like that, like making his presence felt, rebounding the ball on the defensive end, and then being a like dunker spot big, like just there to kind of clean up the glass or catch a lob. So. He literally slotted in Rudy Gobert's role better than Rudy Gobert slotted into his new role in Minnesota. Um, that's so bad, man. So that, that's wild. <clears throat> Caruso at 99, low-key kind of feels low for him. 
Like he's, he's probably a great gonna be, player. Like he's probably going to be first team all defense this year, or at right. least all defense in general. Who's so many um, people ahead of him? Like right ahead of him. Shangoon, ninety eight for Shangoon. Honestly, I, mean, I, I respect it, bro. He is. He's nice. Shangun I think he nice. Udoka is about to unlock him. I like, hope so. Like, That'd be fun to watch, bro. I, that Rockets team would be fun to watch. I need to see the PV, the pieces that he adds around them. Mm-hmm. But they potentially they they got a lot of cat space. They could be a nice little fun team next year. Yeah, and like you said, I know he we talked about it last time, but like his like trying to add a different big, like he's somebody that could play with a more interior focused big, and that right. gives him more opportunity to play on the perimeter and handle the ball, which is like the all, the Rockets offense ran best when he had the ball in his hands in the post or like kind of run the offense through him. So I could see it in front of him is Russ, um, who I think wasn't yeah. on the list the last time that they did it and put him back into the list now. He's higher than that. Like as a player, he's higher than that. Like, the, obviously this season, it doesn't help in the last season. He's a better player than that. Yeah, because in front of him, they got Wendell Carter, Devin Vassell, Zubak, Tobias Harris, and Cam Johnson. Right. I can see arguments all the way. It's Russ is always going to be such an up-and-down player. Yeah, it's, it's just Like I said, it goes back to what I said. Like He's a better player. It's just I, – I can see how this list was constructed. Like, basically, like, your value to 18. And mm-hmm. Russ's value has to be to certain teams. Like so, I see why this list is the way it is. Another interesting one here: Kavon Looney at eighty-seven, right in front of Mitchell Robinson, but both of them are behind Al Horford, Jakob Pertl, and Stephen Adams. Both of them and are behind all. All of them? three of them. Okay. <laughs> honestly, <clears throat> if honest Looney, I would take. Again, we're talking about right now, but even like going off of their playoff run last year. Yeah, exactly. Like, I'd probably take him over Stephen Adams. I'd probably take him over Al. Uh, I'd take him over Pirtle. Al's different because Al can shoot. Like, so it might be yeah. a little bit. Uh, that's valuable, especially like in today's NBA. That's a little valuable. But, uh, I don't know, man. Looney is. Bro, he comes up big for Warriors, bro. He comes up cute. Like, he's a real valuable, like, big man. He has, gives you nothing on the offensive end. But, like, them, them rebounds and hustle points, like, yeah, Looney's big. I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's a little bit more um inflated, though, because he's on the Warriors. Like I said, he's the only rebounder. Over there. Yeah. He's the only guy that does, like, Draymond, I guess. But, like, he's, Draymond's small, smaller right. than him. So, yeah. he's the only guy that gets the rebounds. He sets great screens for them. Like, he. And they shoot a lot of shots, so he has a lot of opportunities to get a lot of rebounds. So it's, it might be a little bit inflated. Have you ever watched any of his college highlights? I heard he was nice. Like I, I saw, his, I saw his high school one. I heard he was nice. Whatever. It, apparently, he had some injury. I don't remember what it was. Um, he had like oh, back, a uh, back problem or something. It was something. Bad. It was something bad. Somebody posted uh, clips of him at UCLA the other day. Uh, I hadn't seen in a while. Bro was looking like KD, like was shifty, like handling the ball on the perimeter, like bro, tapping it out a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> that's what his um, I, that's what his um, like he got interviewed in high school or something like that. It was like next Kevin Durant or something. Like that's who he was supposed to be. But I guess the injuries, you that know, sucks, bro. It's actually good. I mean, it's it. Yes, it definitely does suck. But the fact that he was still able to like basically change the entire way he plays and right. be a quality player in the NBA, uh, good for him. He deserved to get paid. Oh, for sure. I honestly, I don't know if the Warriors are gonna be able to keep him because, like, at this point, if I was any other contending team, I'd be like, now nah, we need somebody like that, bro. Bro, I don't care about nothing on the court but doing his job in whatever mm-hmm. minutes y'all give him. He's right. going to get rebounds. He's going to fight. <laughs> He's going to set good screens and like just do whatever y'all ask him to do. <laughs> As I'm scrolling through, DeAndre Ayton is at 69. He's in front of Robert Williams, Josh Giddy, CJ McCollum, Kuzma, Franz Wagner. He's in front of them? Yeah. I'd rather have Josh Giddy. 
I'd rather have Josh Giddy. I'd rather. I just don't like. I really don't like DeAndre. Yeah. Ayer, bro. I, <laughs> like I'd rather have Robert Williams if he's healthy. Like I, I'm not a fan of DeAndre. Ayer, you know? Healthy Robert Williams, I would take mm-hmm. over Aiden as well. Just 100. He just has more of an impact on the game, and it's only exactly. only on one side of the ball for most of it, other than lost. That's really what. That's what I would need from my center though. Like, like for as bad, not bad, but or not terrible, but like for the way Aiden plays, I need you to be a great offensive big man for you to mm-hmm. be such a softy on the defensive end and rebounding. Like, I need you to be, like, like really scoring at will or bringing something to the offensive end. Like, I yeah. hate TM shoot that little midi. It pisses me off every time. <laughs> yeah. Jared Allen got dropped down here into the mid-60s. He's behind Miles Turner. Derek White is at 63. It's good for him. That's high. I, yeah, exactly. But he definitely deserves that. it. Getting to like the top 50 here. LaMelo Ball is at 48 in front of Wiggins, Gordon, Brooke Lopez. Rudy Gobert is at 52. I'm uh, not a fan. I just, I'm not a fan of Rudy. I'm really not. After this season, I can't put him there. That's <laughs> tough. I'm not a fan. Even before this, I just was never – even when he was winning DPOYs, I was never <laughs> a fan of Rudy Gobert, bro. Like, I just it's, – nah, I'm straight. It's, I feel like Rudy's like either a guy you love him or you hate him. Because I see people make the case that, like, it's the fact that they – like, in Utah, it was the roster. Like, they had no good perimeter defenders, which I get it. But, bro, there's no way you're telling me you're a liability on defense at times as the defensive player of the year. <laughs> like, how is that a thing, bro? Just – Saying that makes sense. We have to take you off the court or they are attacking you as the DPOY, bro. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. History books are going to be crazy, bro. Second most defensive play of the years ever. Oh, God, bro. In like 15 years, what are going to be like, yo, bro, Rudy Gobert, like, <laughs> why is he not a top five defender ever? I'll be like, bro, come on. Like, you did not watch this guy. We're going to be like one of these old heads <laughs> defending some of these players. <laughs> like, oh, yeah. <laughs> It's gonna, it's gonna get bad. Bro. People just gonna look at this. We're gonna look, go on basketball reference. Look at the players from now, and they gotta say something like outrageous, like something crazy. Like, bro, what do you mean James Harden isn't better than Kobe Bryant? Are you looking at the numbers? I'm like, bro, stop, bro. What are we talking about? Let's get into gross. some of the the top ones here. Here's another good one. Kyrie at 37. He's behind Darius Garland, Jamal Murray, and Drew Holiday. He's better than all of them. I mean, Drew Holiday's defense is better. But that that would be, honestly, the only them. one that I would probably consider, especially off of this season, like how much of like an offensive output he added for the Bucks, especially with Chris mm-hmm. Middleton. But He's definitely better than Darius Garland. Yeah, Darius Garland and Jamal Murray is a little crazy. Yeah, what? I think they probably – that had to have been lumping in too much of – yeah, talking about off-court. We're not – that's it's not, not what like, I'm worried about. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. Like, we're, are we talking about are they a good basketball player? Are we talking about just like who would you have on your team because of all this other stuff too? Like, that's what it seems like. That's what the list seems like it's about. Yeah, taking everything into consideration. Julius Randle, Brandon Ingram, and Cat. How would you rank those three right now? Julius Randle, Brandon Ingram, and Cat. As far as who would I rather have on my team? Who I feel like the better players? I'd rather have Bi. Mm-hmm. I'd agree. B.I. Cat than Julius Randle. I would have it the same way. They have it, Julius Randle at 30 in front of B.I., and then Cat is at 32. Nah, Julius Randle is not better than B.I. Yeah, I think B.I., like, every time I've seen this list, he's been around this range, and, like, I just feel like it's too low. Like, he's behind Lori. Like, Lori had a great yeah, year. Yeah, better like, than Lori. No, right. I, yeah, that's what I'm saying. We're just – he had a good year, but come on, bro. B.I. is better than Lori. What are we talking about? B.I. should be around, like, he said he's, like, 31. 31, yeah. He should be around, like, 20, like, at least, like, 25, I feel like, somewhere around. I don't okay. know who's ahead, but, like, I feel like. 25 in here is Siakam. Would you take Siakam or B.I.? B.I. Really? i take B.I. I think I might Siakam keep Siakam. Is, Siakam is nice, but I take. I think I'll take B.I. over Siakam. Okay. In front of Siakam is Ant. And it's better than – obviously, he's better than both of them. Definitely then it's Trey Young and then Bam. 
I'd rather take Ant than Bam. <laughs> I, honestly, I'd rather take Ant over Bam right now. I'd rather take nah. I don't. Trey Young is such. He's such a liability on defense, though. Like he's so bad on defense. LeBron is at fifteen, which is crazy. He did, and you, you see, this is the first year he didn't get an MVP vote ever. I peed. He didn't That's deserve crazy. One. <laughs> he did it, it but it's wild. like, bro, twenty seasons. You just had the first year. <laughs> there was a writer somewhere that was like. Nah, he was the best player. He was like one <laughs> of the five best players in the league. Right. That's crazy. Right. The GOAT. Going into the top 15, right? AD is at 13. Damian Lillard is at 12. Shea is at 11. And then to start the top 10, you got D-Book. I feel like I mean, all I that really, is fair. Yeah, I was about to say, there's nothing, there's nothing, you can switch them, but there's nothing that's like outrageous. Mm-hmm. But who, of, wait, wait, who's at uh like 14 and 13 if LeBron's at 15? Uh 14 is Ja and 13 is AD. Oh, okay. All right. And then Jimmy off of his playoff performance is in the top 10. He's number nine. Can't, can't complain. Right? Kawhi at eight. Jason can't Tatum complain. at seven. Luca at six. Oh, that's just because he didn't make the playoffs. I swear if he made the playoffs, bro, he'd be higher than that. Yeah. KD at five, Joel at four, and then Steph, so, so Giannis, the, and Jokic at one. You, wait, Jokic is at one? Jokic is at one. Yeah. Giannis is at two? Steph, Steph is, at, is three. at three. And B is at four. MVP, MVB, whatever you're going to call it, is at four. <laughs> I think Giannis is still the best player on the planet. So I'll Yeah, I think – I've seen some people kind of on some wild discourse, like maybe we were too quick to crown Giannis as the best player. I'm like, ah, one bro. series? Give people room to fail. You cannot just be act like, bro, people act like Jordan went to the finals all like 15 whatever years he was in the league. But give people room to fail, bro. You cannot just t- give people something and then take it away just because they had one fail. And it wasn't even like, he still had like 30 something and 15 boards in that game. Like, it wasn't like he, and he's he heard choke. <laughs> exact, bro. Come on, bro. I'm still, until he proves me otherwise, or somebody else just goes crazy again next year, he's still the best player on the planet to me. I agree. Like, I look, and it's all, it's always going to be like room for growth because he still has to grow as a shooter to some extent. And like, at the end of the day, bro, his motor is like on a different level compared to every other player in the league. And like that alone mm-hmm. covers so much of the ground with like him just being seven foot in a bulldozer. Literally. Um, but so yeah, I'd agree. But I've seen people say wild takes after this last series that like we're too quick to crown him because he can't shoot. Like this is a problem. His free throws are this and that's like these these aren't new things, bro. These were like this when you were saying say, he was the best. That, bro, that be the thing. It, they act like they just found this information out. It, it's always been like this, bro. Like what's what has changed just after the series? What has changed? That's part of why when he won the finals, it was such a big deal. It was like, bro, in a closeout game, he's a bad free throw shooter. He missed like two free throws, and he kept going to the line. And he kept making them. Like that's mm-hmm. a part of why the that was such a big moment. Now, now they lost, and he had a bad free throw shooting game. Like, oh, this is a problem now. This is a new developing problem. Like, bro, this has been, it's been like this, bro. They do it the, uh, they do it the same thing the opposite way. People overrate people. Like, bro, I've seen, I've seen Steph Curry goat cases since that game seven. Like that, he is the greatest player ever. What are we talking about right now, bro? The this whole – the only thing I dislike about the Lakers-Warriors series is that what is about to come out of this series on ESPN and any of the larger, like, sports <laughs> news sources, oh, it's going to be funny. filthy, like, it's disgusting. Be so bad, bro. Bro, if Curry wins this series, bro. Is Curry better than LeBron all the time? <laughs> Curry, Curry's obviously LeBron's kryptonite. Like LeBron, he's, I did, they are I see, already talking about that, and I'm like, what are what, what were we watching, bro? What were we bro, watching? Now, now all of a sudden, I've seen like, bro, Curry is this um like he's what? It was like I forgot what the stat was. It was like he's like 15 and seven in the playoffs against LeBron. I'm like, did Kevin Durant not exist? Like, what? Where's all the context now? This like, why is it? Oh, why is it all of a sudden Hill, Curry? J.R. Smith, Tristan Thompson, <laughs> and Kevin Love with him, bro. 
Oh my god, bro! Now all of a sudden it's like, bro, Curry. He's like he's he he beats LeBron every time in the finals. I'm like, bro, yeah, I wonder why. If I'd had right. Kevin Durant, Clay Thompson, Draymond, I'd probably beat LeBron too. And it sucks at the same time. It's like I don't want to discredit Curry. Like I think he's really putting together like a legacy that like is about to stand the test of time. Mm-hmm. But it's like y'all take it way too far, bro. That's why you got to listen to the Off the Glass podcast. You're not about to do it like some of these other people, bro. Thanks. You got to keep Thanks. it real with y'all. Because, look, bro, one series does not define Giannis. This series is not about to – how does this affect Braun's legacy? It doesn't that it doesn't much. At like, all. His legacy at this is point, etched in stone, bro. Everything is icing on the cake at this point, bro. Right. Nothing – like, no, none of those, For like, these cemented – I was just about to say, none of these, like, cemented guys should do anything to make you think any less of them all the time. Everything should just be an add-on from here on out. Right. Um, like, yeah. We could honestly, you know, leave it at that. Cause, yeah. But – People are going to be crazy. The, the way that they're going to cover this series, the way that they're already covering it, again, like you said, talking about Steph is LeBron's kryptonite is crazy because they're acting like they just play one-on-one for the NBA championship. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Well, that's going to do it for another episode of the Off the Glass podcast. As always, we appreciate you for tuning in. Like we said, be sure to like, comment, subscribe. Um, look in the links in the description. We're going to have timestamps. Um, if you want to, you know, skip around and, and go to different parts of the episode. Um, and I, like I said, in the beginning as well, um, links to our social um, and my NBA channel as well. So please be sure to, to, to follow us, subscribe to the channel as well. Um, and yeah, and then keep it coming. The playoffs have been great. Every time it feels like so much to talk about. We're probably going to come with another episode probably Friday or Saturday. Um, mm-hmm. I think every team will have, you know, played another game by then. Um, every season, every series will have two or three games deep. So we're going to have plenty to talk about then at the end of the week. So as always, I'm Billy. That's Dame. And we out. Yes, sir. Lakers and four. <laughs> Lakers and four. Lakers and four.